The most interesting and accurate studies have actually recently come out of Germany. There's a, there's a big one called the Vici study, where they enrolled children from the year sort of 2016 to 2018. And there's been a couple of really good papers as a result of this big study. The first study I'll mention is um, for children sort of age one to three, which is that sort of typical toddler age. And what they did was they had 127 children that, that were vegan in Germany and they analysed their micronutrient intakes and uh, they wanted to see you know, were there any gaps, how was, it, you know, how was it for the children. And what was interesting is that there were absolutely no differences in the height, no differences in the weight um, between the vegan children and the omnivorous children in this particular study group. Uh, both sets of children had plenty of protein. I know that's always a big question for a lot of people is where do they get their protein? Well, you can get it from plenty of places and they both had plenty of protein. The vegan children had more fiber, which is a really important thing for reducing constipation, which is a really big problem for a lot of kids. And interestingly, they actually had more micronutrients as well um, mm. on balance. So they had more vitamin E, more vitamin B1, more folate, uh, more vitamin C, more magnesium. We have a huge body of evidence now to say that saturated fats have been linked to long-term health risks, long-term disease risks such as heart disease. And in fact, when you look at some of the data, even children and teenagers now have fatty streaks on their vessels, in their heart, their coronary arteries. Uh, and we know this from autopsy results. There were some case studies from um, the war where you had teenagers who were fighting in Vietnam, for example. They did uh, the autopsies and they showed that these, these uh, young people have evidence of heart disease already forming in their vessels, these fatty streaks, which then lead to atherosclerosis and, and hardening of the arteries and hypertension. And that was Dr. Gemma Newman, a general practitioner who's been practicing for over 18 years in the UK. She's a senior partner at a family medical practice and has a wealth of knowledge and experience on optimizing you and your family's health. She has OBGYN, family planning, and pediatric credentials, as well as her own experience transitioning her family to plant-based many years ago. Her book, which has just hit stores in the U.S., The Plant Power Doctor, A Simple Prescription for a Healthier You, is a complete how-to go-to that is the necessary science for people to feel confident and empowered to thrive on their plant-based diet. It's the perfect combination of recipe book and information to help you as you navigate your journey towards optimal health and preventing disease. I highly recommend this book as I've just begun to read it and I'm already so excited about it and loving it. Dr. Gemma is exactly what we need right now in this world with so many conflicting and confusing messaging and opinions on how we can best thrive in this modern world. It was such a pleasure talking with her on all things child nourishment and raising healthy plant-based kids, something I'm also very passionate about. Her approach is very inclusive towards all types of lifestyles and how to adapt a healthy plant-based diet, and she provides a compassionate and understanding lens through her years of experiencing all different types of patients and circumstances. We covered so much in this two-hour episode from what the science says on the benefits of raising children plant-based and how it stacks up against dietary patterns rich in animal foods, how to best adopt a diet rich in whole plant foods, nutrients of focus and supplementation, child teeth health, picky eater tips, her thoughts on ancestral diets, breastfeeding, starting baby on solid foods, and so much more. Dr. Gemma is a breath of fresh air. She's incredibly smart and endearing, and I've had such a great conversation with her. I hope you find this conversation valuable and enriching for you and your family's life. Let's get started. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. I am so excited to have you here, Dr. Gemma, and talk about all things child nourishment and raising healthy plant-based kids. I get so many questions about this, and it's such a topic that I think is really important and helpful to talk about, and you're so knowledgeable about this, so Aww. thank you for being here. Thank you, Ellen. I'm really delighted to be here and honored to share time with you, and yeah, it's a really important topic, and I'm really happy to be shedding some light on it and reassuring parents as well. That's wonderful. So can you kind of set the groundwork, lay the groundwork a little bit and explain maybe your background and how you came to advocating what you do and being passionate what you do? Yeah. So I'm a family doctor. I've been a doctor for, oh, nearly 18 years, a long time. And I always knew that I wanted to work with families and uh, follow patients over a long period of time, get to know them. And... Child health has been an integral part of that. I did paediatrics as part of my training. But really, when it came to plant-based nutrition, that came up a little bit later in my journey. 
Um, and it was actually prompted initially by my husband because he wanted to learn how to run long distances without getting inflamed and injured. And so he started to read about what ultra marathon run runners did. People like Rich Roll when he wrote Finding Ultra and uh, Brandon Brazio, I think he's called, and Scott Jurek, one of the most well-known ultra runners of all time. Yeah. And he decided to go plant-based. And for me... It was a bit of a new territory at that time. I was thinking, oh, that doesn't sound like a good idea. Are you going to be able to get everything that you need? Um, and also socially, I thought maybe we would be ostracized. People wouldn't invite us over for dinner. So for me, it was actually like something quite new. And then he did brilliantly with his plant-based diet. I was watching, learning, uh, and he ran a, a marathon about an hour and 10 minutes faster than his previous attempt, which is insanely... Um, amazing like it's just a huge improvement that is amazing yeah um and it got my attention but for me not being focused I mean I have run marathons twice before but my focus was not on uh, being an athlete or training my focus was could this help my patients mm -hmm. could this improve heart disease cancer risk <clears throat> uh, diabetes risk could it even reverse certain disorders could it improve autoimmune issues gut health issues and I was really excited to find that yes there was quite a lot of evidence to say that it could mm. and once I'd implemented it in my own life as well I felt more confident to talk about the practicalities of it and when I then developed the confidence after having read about it for so long and I talked to my patients about it, that was really where the magic happened. And I, I got to see some fantastic results for my patients. Uh, and yeah, that, that was the beginning. And I love talking about plant based diets for families, too, because many people go plant based who have children and they want to share that lifestyle with their children. So it makes sense then to be able to share more practical tips and advice for families as well. Totally. That mm. is so cool. And actually very similar to my husband and how he got into plant-based eating. It, it was a little bit evolved because I had been plant-based first. And over time, <clears throat> over time, he was like a little bit more interested in it, seeing myself like, you know, gaining my health back and everything like that. And so then he read book, many, many books. And one of them was Rich Roll's book. And he got into running because he didn't used to want to run or exercise. But when he started eating plant-based, he found himself with the energy waking up and wanting to move. And he's like, I could go for a run today. <laughs> and so he got so into it and also um, was running marathons and doing incredibly well. So that's so funny how similar that aspect is with our husbands. It is. It's interesting. And it also speaks to how important it is to feel supported because you know, not everybody will necessarily have a partner that's fully on board and it's about trying to understand the dynamic between you and as a family what works and how old your children are and it can really be a very individual journey I think for a lot of families totally it is and the best is like mutual respect and you know listening to each other and stuff um, yeah. in regards to that so what does the science the evidence say towards the benefits of raising children plant-based well we have a, a position statement from the ADA and the BDA to state that a plant-based diet is uh, healthful for all stages of life. Um, the ADA goes a bit further and says that it's also useful for helping to manage and prevent chronic diseases as I mentioned before mm -hmm. heart disease cancer things like that. Um, the British uh, Dietetic Association also talks about the importance of a plant-rich diet for planetary health. They have their One Blue Dot campaign where they also highlight how vital it is that we all eat more plants for environmental and planetary health, as well as the Eat Lancet campaign. So there's quite a few different bodies that state that eating more plants is good. When it comes to paediatric nutrition, I think it's important to state that um, there are a couple of agencies that have a differing opinion. Like there's mm -hmm. a Belgian Academy and a Spanish Academy of nu uh, Nutrition and uh, Pediatrics that state that um, they think that when you have a vegan diet, they're worried about mm -hmm. certain aspects for children, which is what I, I thought it was important to sort of touch on. Yeah. Because when you look at the guidelines that they've put in place, you begin to realize that a lot of those fears are based on single case studies. Mm. And when you look at the case studies and the detail, it's generally raw diets or whether children haven't received enough nutrition generally, enough calories, uh, quite specific case studies, which, yep. as you may know, are essentially formal anecdotes. Mm -hmm. And that's difficult because you, you can't really place dietary guidelines on anecdotes um, you have to look at the large body of evidence. And so what I find interesting is that when you do look at that, 
And when you look at what limited research we have on vegan children, that they can indeed thrive and do brilliantly on a plant-based diet. And in fact, it has the potential to reduce their risk of chronic disease, which we know, but also potentially reduce their risk of uh, seasonal illnesses as well, um, allergic illnesses such as asthma and eczema, which we can get onto. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of potential real benefits. Mm -hmm. So I suppose one of the take homes from <clears throat> this part of the conversation is to say, if you are um, having a vegan diet, there's no reason not to enjoy a vegan diet for the whole family. And in fact, there are some potential benefits. It's just important to understand that variety and planning is is helpful. Yeah, and having a well-planned diet, no matter what you're eating, whether you're eating plant-based or not, is still important and needs to take, be taken into consideration. I mean, we see people on all kinds of diets with animal foods that are suffering all kinds of illnesses um, because of, like you said, not having well planned. You need to well plan any diet and there's key nutrients of focus that are important. And like you said, with those specific stories, I've definitely seen some of those stories. I remember a couple of them, certain ones in Europe were like um, parents were feeding their infant like under three months old, like applesauce or regular plant milk as opposed to a formula since they weren't breastfeeding um, and they weren't breastfeeding at all. So like things like that is just like... Um, not knowledgeable, not doing what a well planned diet would needs to entail and so those types of examples are really an unfair balance to what the body of evidence shows yeah i agree it is an unfair balance and as you rightly pointed out you know the health protection agency says that babies under the age of one should have breast milk or formula you should never feed your baby under one a different kind of milk especially not a homemade milk mm -hmm. um and as you mentioned you know there are certain case studies that of concern <clears throat> with like, perhaps um, fully raw diets or not getting enough calories mm -hmm. for the for the child's development yeah and, and again that's really rare these are far and away really rare cases mm -hmm. the vast majority of parents will have some basic understanding of the nutritional needs of their child and will also do the research hopefully to make sure that um, they are giving the child the very best um, but yeah, it's true for any dietary pattern. And as you've pointed out, children um, on the whole in Western societies now are becoming a little bit more unwell in terms of increased rates of things like asthma, eczema, other allergies, obesity. And these are things that could potentially be improved using a healthy whole foods plant-based diet. Yeah, it's interesting huh, how like that's something like a poor example of a plant-based diet will be highlighted in the media, whereas a poor example of a diet with animal foods with a child who's suffering from uh, type 2 diabetes, really young, and um, obesity and chronic illness, like that's not going to be highlighted. Like what is, what is that diet looking and entailing? So there's kind of an unfair balance because do you think that that is the reason or what else could be the reason why there might be some concern for parents and like the idea of raising your kids plant-based like yeah. what that could look like like well, why it's, a, it's more of a, an existential question i think people generally have a negativity bias when it comes to the word vegan mm -hmm. and i would say the, the media on the whole would would sometimes have a negativity bias whatever the age and of course our children are so important to us mm -hmm. you know we you know we you birth a child and you want the very best for them and so that's a very emotive topic so nutrition is emotive and then child health is even more emotive because obviously we care about our children more than pretty much anything else mm -hmm. and I think perhaps it's a combination of those things that can lead to certain fears and uh, misapprehensions that I think it's important to address mm -hmm. absolutely yeah so what about let's say like some specific concerns parents might have in regards to raising children plant-based like if they feel like well don't children need saturated fat from animal foods after they're weaned off breast milk what are your What's your take on that and how, how do you respond to that? So I would say that children do need fats, but they don't need saturated fats. Uh, we have a huge body of evidence now to say that saturated fats have been linked to long-term health risks, long-term disease risks such as heart disease. And in fact, when you look at some of the data, even children and teenagers now have fatty streaks on their vessels, in their heart, their coronary arteries. Uh, and we know this from autopsy results, sadly, when children have died in perhaps road traffic accidents or even there were some case studies from um, the war where you had teenagers who were fighting in Vietnam, for example. They did uh, the autopsies and they showed that these, these uh, young people have evidence of heart disease already forming in their vessels, these fatty streaks, which then lead to atherosclerosis and 
and hardening of the arteries and hypertension and and um, at risk of heart disease so it's absolutely not true to say that children need saturated fat but what they do need are sources of dietary fat in general yeah um i think that's an important take home for people Mm -hmm. because children do not thrive on a low fat diet Mm -hmm. um it's great because if you give them healthy fats like um avocados and um olives uh, nut milks uh, nut butters um sort of seed butters coconuts these are great natural sources of fat which will help them to absorb fat soluble vitamins Mm -hmm. a d uh, e and k um and also just help them get enough calories that they need for their um for their growth and their little stomachs yeah yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, because i think that's one of the main considerations that people on a more whole food plant-based diet should keep in mind Mm -hmm. because i know that you have a very health conscious audience Mm -hmm. we're not talking about the average standard american diet probably Mm -hmm. yeah for most of the people that follow you yeah um, people are going to be wanting to enjoy a much more vibrant um, and rich diet full of plant foods. So what I would say is perhaps slightly different in terms of children's nutritional needs is the absolute focus on making sure they have a healthy fat as much as possible with each mm-hmm. meal. Yes. But also, as you've mentioned, they have little stomachs. Uh, they're probably going to be wanting to prioritize playtime over mealtime. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's important to make sure that you know they have the things they need, which is why a lot of pediatric dietitians actually recommend a mixture of refined grains and whole grains for children because it allows them to fulfill their um, calorie requirement mm-hmm. and also um, slightly less in terms of the um, phytate con- uh, concentration of the mm-hmm. grains. Having said that, they are less nutritionally dense. They have less zinc, less selenium, mm-hmm. and whole grains in general are far healthier for most people. But in terms of children, pediatric dietitians also suggest you could give them a mixture of refined and whole grains for that reason, because they've yeah. got such little stomachs. You want to make sure that they're getting their calories that they yeah. need. Yeah. Um, but generally speaking, I think having meals based on those starchy carbohydrates, those healthy whole grains, and a source of plant-based protein is a simple way to make sure that they're having a lovely balanced meal. Yep. Um, Whether they're getting their macronutrients, like they're getting a protein-based source, a carbohydrate source, and a fat source at their meals for sure. Exactly. Um, So, you know, what that might look like on a plate, you might give them something like, you know, rice and beans. Uh, You might give them, like, as a snack, like carrot sticks and hummus. You might be giving um, things like uh, couscous and falafels. So you have sort of an an obvious starchy base with a protein-rich meal, and then you can add in maybe a nut butter or a seed butter or some avocado or whatever else you like to make sure that they've got all the things that they need in a meal. Yeah, that's really helpful. I've definitely found that to be the case as well, like having plenty of healthy fats and um, throughout their day and every meal being very helpful for them to get full and to be satiated throughout their day while also just having an abundance of the fresh fruits and vegetables and the whole grains and the beans, the legumes. Yes, exactly. The legumes are so important. And it's lovely to see, I mean, I've had the real pleasure of seeing your children and how how amazing and energy filled and how thriving they are. So it's lovely to see how you implement this practically on a day-to-day basis with your own family. It's, it's really special. Thank you so much. I think the biggest portion is really just being the example. You know, like a lot of parents will have like picky eater question tips and um, just like how to navigate like a healthy, balanced approach that um, just helps kids feel good about the food that they're eating and for it to be just, I don't know, just a really good experience for kids that's abundant and yeah. also nourishing them and also like educational for them. So they're like empowered to want to make choices that are good for their bodies that it helps them feel good. So what has been like your experience with your kids? Yeah, I mean, you're right. I think healthy nutritious meals in childhood lay that foundation for children to feel empowered to make healthy foods for themselves as they get older and also gives them lovely memories because food's about so much more than nutrition as well it's Mm -hmm. about pleasure it's about memory making Mm -hmm. so if you're doing it with your kids i think another tip which i'm sure you do is is to get them involved if they're feeling a bit like they don't want to eat the things that you're always um necessarily giving them say okay well you can choose this or this and would you like to help me prepare it Um, So there's lots of tips and tricks like that, which I guess we can go into. Yeah. I think for my children, um, it's been a great journey because with my oldest son, he was really excited about eating more plants. And he also had more of an ethical stance, which uh, was really interesting. And 
I don't know why it surprised me because I think that children are generally more connected to animals than perhaps adults are but it was a lovely thing to see so we were at um, a farm park and we were picking out some eggs from the chickens and he he loves chickens at the time they were his favorite animal or bird and he was asking me okay so what do we eat when we eat chicken what do we eat and I said oh well we eat their muscles he said okay their muscles how do we get their muscles Mm -hmm. and I said well we we have to kill the chicken he said you have to kill the chicken (laughs) I was like yep (laughs) like that was a real kind of jaw dropping moment for him and he said he was only four Mm -hmm. uh, or three uh, very very young mm-hmm. and um he said well how do we how do we kill the chicken i said mm-hmm. oh, i don't really know mm-hmm. um and i was thinking i'm really down a difficult path here um a stun gun maybe a knife yeah um i'm not really sure and he said oh okay and the look on his face mm-hmm. and i said look if you don't want to eat chickens you don't have to eat chickens we've got lots of other ways that we can have really enjoyable foods and i listed all the foods that he eats that didn't have chicken in and that mm-hmm. he loves and he's like yeah I don't want to eat chicken yeah <laughs> I don't want to eat chickens anymore so for him it was really an extension of his love for the animals which then helped him to feel a lot more aligned to this way of living whereas for my younger son he grew up with it so it's just something that he knows because that's what we do as a family mm-hmm. and it was in a way a, an easier transition I would imagine than for other parents who perhaps took on a more plant-based lifestyle when the children were maybe sort of eight nine ten or Mm -hmm. teenage years Mm -hmm. where you know you have a little bit more of a a sort of a fixed pattern in the way the children like to eat Mm -hmm. so it was a lot easier I imagine than for some parents because Ted had just grown up with it and that's just what we eat at home we've talked about it so he understands that there is an active decision in the things that we eat rather than just taking whatever's there and and eating whatever's available like there's a lot of conscious thought that goes into the foods that we provide and that's something that that we discuss as a family um but it's interesting because every family is very unique and it's a real learning journey because a lot of families you know the pe- one parent or other may start a plant-based journey and not really know exactly what they're doing and find their own way and then want to introduce it to the family when they feel more confident um, I don't know how that was for you. Uh, you mentioned that you that you had a vegan lifestyle from very young. So you had already decided to be vegan before you had your first child. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I was 19 when I went plant-based vegan. And so my kids have all been, you know, plant-based since conception. And I breastfed all of them. And they, that's pretty much all they've known. Mm. Um, but they have a lot of friends who are not plant-based. So they're around it all the time and so they're very actively aware and in the conversations of how um, because they also have that ethical connection <clears throat> where they think about the animals and so just the just the educational conversations surrounding around love and mutual respect for everyone and the active choices that you can make on your own when you're at parties or gatherings and stuff and my eldest is like especially really appreciative when I go out of my way to go get a vegan version for him of whatever the part they're going to be serving at a party. Right. Um, like if we know there's going to be pizza and like regular cake at a party, you know, what, uh, recently actually the, he had a baseball game and I was going to go watch his baseball game, but there was a party for one of the kids after the game. And I asked him, I'm like, do you want me to go? you know, like stop at, at the grocery store and pick up these foods for you during your game. And he's like, oh, I would so appreciate that. Yes, that would be awesome. So I went and picked up, you know, a vegan cupcake and um, like a plant-based burger with taro in it and some like vegan sushi hand rolls, like his favorite foods that were there and brought it to the party. And after the party, he was like, thank you so much, mom. Like that food was so delicious. It was so much better than any of the food even looked at the party. And it was so good. I really appreciate Aww. it. And it just like, you know kids are really appreciative when they get to socialize and also like with their friends but also be able to make the choices that they want to make so and also helping them to feel empowered and loved like if they don't end up wanting to make that choice you know because that way they know that like mom and dad loves me no matter what I end up choosing yeah exactly (laughs) I think every family is going to navigate those things in their own way yeah um I'm looking back on all the parties that we were invited to for the uh, for, for my boys and you know quite often you're right people won't necessarily have all vegan options there and we would say to our oldest son you know you can have what you want to eat at the party 
Um, but if you wanted to wait, we could give you a nice piece of cake or some ice cream at home if you yeah. want to try that at home instead. And sometimes he would just say, actually, yeah, I want to wait. And in fact, every time now I look back on it, I don't think he ever actually ended up choosing. Yeah. But because he had the choice, yeah, he liked, I think he liked the fact that he had the choice. Yeah, um, I think I think what's so important in raising kids is like, you know, surrounding with like love and respect and like education and example. Like really, I get a lot of questions about picky eaters. So did you have any um, experience with transitioning maybe your eldest or do you have advice for parents who do have questions like that when you who come into your practice who are wanting to eat more plant-based and raise their kids that way like what picky eater advice do you have yeah I think it's it's interesting because different families have different ways of doing things but what I found to be really helpful is the idea that you know essentially the parent tends to choose generally what's put on the plate and then the child should really get to choose how much of it they eat Mm -hmm. and some families have like a one bite rule or a one spoon rule when it comes to new foods just to kind of give a little taste of something new but we also have to remember that research tells us that it's really common for young babies and children and especially toddler years it may take 10 to 15 attempts at a new food for for a young child to think yeah I want to have that again And so don't get disheartened if you've given something 10, 11 times and every time the child rejects it, just think, okay, well, it will be on the plate, just a taster every single time. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they usually do have a little bit um, or decide that actually they like it now or, you know, so it's not something where you try it once and if they reject it, that's it. You can leave a little bit on the plate every single time and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, And... I think also portion sizes are sometimes confusing for parents because we often will give a portion that we think that they should eat, but then actually their stomachs are just too small to really want to have that much food. Um, So when you think about things like whole grains, if you look at the size of your child's fist, closed fist, that's about the portion of a whole grain that you'd give your child. And if you look at their hands spread out open and you look at the size of their palm, not the fingers, if you have two palms full, that's about the right sort of portion for fruit or vegetables. And you can see, if you just look at your child's palm, actually, hmm, that might be a bit smaller than I've been aiming for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so don't get disheartened if you put a really big plate of food and they just want to pick at it or they're nibbling or they're not eating it. So that's another tip is to sort of relax. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes when you bring a lot of anxiety, I think, to the dinner table, mm-hmm. it can cause a battle of wills. And when it becomes a battle of wills, you never win because Mm. you either let your child win or you win at the expense of your relationship with your child. Absolutely. So try to relax, try to make it fun, uh, involve them if you can. Uh, They have choices, maybe one or two, not more than that. And, you know, obviously things that you have decided that you're willing to make that day. And then they choose how much of it they want to eat and... If you have a neurotypical child, they generally won't let themselves go hungry. Uh, But um, I would say it's a special case if your child has autism or certain sensory processing issues, um, you may need to get the specialist help of of perhaps a dietitian or a nutritionist if they have developed very sort of rigid ideas about the foods and the taste and the textures that they're willing to eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all such good advice. Um, I've definitely found the best... best, uh, experience that I've had with my kids is just being the example and what you said about the you know what we have at the table this is what we're eating we do that at dinner time and it's like whatever we make this is what we're eating we don't make special separate foods for the kids we don't make something for us and then something for them it's like this is what we eat together as a family and they know that going into it this is family dinner we don't make something else in regards to like breakfast and lunch and snacks I love to have like an empowered decision for them where they're like what do you want to eat do you want to help me make it um a lot of times they like to be able to make it on their own it really helps them feel empowered and loved by their parents I think to just know that we trust them and are there if they need help and then just like getting them in the garden even if you have just a little garden for a certain time of year if you live in somewhere with like a strong climate like when they get to pick their own anything (laughs) they generally get really excited to eat it if they pick their kale from the garden or tomatoes from the garden or whatever it is I feel like that just helps kids feel so excited we were picking carrots from our garden they were just like what can we do with this let's juice it into some vegetables or let's let's eat it in a salad and they just get so excited to see the whole process unfold yeah and then with things like vegetables I think a lot of times 
um, when kids really don't like vegetables, tell me what you think about this. I think a lot of times it's like a taste bud related thing if they've grown up eating a lot of hyper processed, highly processed foods with a lot of flavor of salt, sugar, oil, and everything that they're eating that a simple plain fruit or vegetable is generally not near as, near as appealing. And so it's just one of those things, like you said, just, you know, having patience and then being the example too. Because for me, I'm like, if I'm making a salad, I'm like, does it, does any of you guys want to make a salad with me? Elvis is always a yes, because he loves salads. Sandy is a sometimes, Scout is a sometimes. So if they're like, nah, I'm like, all right, so I just make it for me and Elvis. And then they always they end up to. on my shoulder <laughs> and they're eating the salad with me because they see me eating the salad. They're like, oh, that actually does look good. And they see me enjoying it and loving it. And also when I explain the nutritional benefits that I feel from enjoying these like tender greens and they, they get excited and they actually get really excited when they know these foods are helping my body, you know, yeah. in this way or that with my strength and my, um, my hair and all these different things. I kind of like like to educate on that and that excites them too yeah that's a really lovely way of doing it because you want to focus on the things that will make them feel vibrant and strong and healthy and also as you say to involve them with it and they when they see it they want to have it and also maybe make it a fun thing like you know, I remember a phase where I would turn an avocado into a car for my for my <laughs> so oldest cute. child, and I'd I'd sort of turn it upside down, and I I would make cucumber um, uh, wheels for the car, and yes. then I would sort of slice it so it looked like a car. Yes, and he was so excited by that. That was like a, a snack or something. He loved it. And celery sticks, I put like an almond butter in a celery stick and then I put little raisins in and it was ants on a boat. Yeah. And he loved it and he wanted to eat the whole thing. And, you know, yes. it's just, it's quite fun to get creative. But at the same time, like you say, with a family meal, you don't want to be making like five different meals. You've got your fifth baby on the way. You imagine having to do, totally. you know, seven meals or six mm-hmm. meals. That's mm-hmm. crazy. So having having one big family meal is lovely. And then the kids hopefully can get excited about what they have. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Oh, there's so much to say about even just this topic of like helping kids love the food that they're eating and the nourishing foods that's good for them. Mm. Um, we've totally had our days too where we make like funny faces out of apples, apples and bananas and different fruits. And they love that. I think it's really helpful too not to add more more onto our plate as mothers that we already have or parents fathers too um but like making your food beautiful yeah um is is something that's enticing not only for us but for the ki- for kids too it's true i think basically a real fail safe from my point of view which doesn't require any more effort is just to make a smiley face <laughs> pretty much a smiley face on anything works yeah you, know, you could do it with oatmeal um you could do it with anything on the plate different veggies um, and it just, yeah, it makes them want to eat it a little bit more. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so I want to get a little bit back into like the science of yeah. this because I do um, think that that is really helpful for parents who are kind of like, well, how do my kids need animal foods at all? Do they need some? Should, like what is the most optimal for our well-being? And so some people do kind of align or look at like maybe studies that are presented that animal foods are, you know, um, providing or supporting these types of negative health outcomes like heart disease and stuff and think well these studies don't include um testing on like grass-fed beef or um you know raw milk and something something like that so what are your thoughts on that because if you look at a lot of studies they're just like they might be tested against like standard diets against a plant-based diet from a holistic family who is being conscious about their food so what are your thoughts on that so I get that people would feel that way because people are wanting to eat a more natural way, maybe the way that their ancestors ate. Um, But then when you look at what we have in terms of data, I think ancestral ways of eating can be very varied across the globe. And, you know, what your ancestors ate might be quite different from what one of your neighbor's ancestors ate. But also how far back are we talking when it comes to ancestors? If we, if we go back you know, millions of years, then the vast majority of those ancestors would literally have just had stuff like vegetables or fruits. Um, you know, they would have picked up maybe on a few insects here and there, <laughs> fungus on leaves. Like, I don't really fancy eating that no. ancestrally. <laughs> so like, I think it's important to try and understand, well, what do we mean by an ancestral way of eating? Um, and what specific benefits are you really looking for? It's true to say that uh, clearly meat has played a role in many different kinds of diets over the generations. Uh, but the I'd say the majority of foods that, that humans have thrived on over the generations has been 
plant-based fruits, veggies, whole grains, legumes. And we have genetic adaptations to enjoy cooked uh, foods, to enjoy legumes, to enjoy grains. Uh, we have extra amylase enzymes that we have in our mouth so that we, we know that we are um, designed in a way to be able to enjoy these abundant plant foods. So that's, if you like, an ancestral way of eating uh, yeah. as well. It just really depends on how far back you go. And we, I think people focus on Paleolithic man a lot like paleo diets uh, but if you look at paleolithic stool samples you see that they have hugely fibrous diets like about 150 grams a day of fiber which is unthinkable compared to how much fiber we eat now which i think the guidelines say 30 grams is ideal and we tend to have about somewhere between sort of 15 and 18 grams yeah the standard american yeah yeah so when you look at it that way you think okay well there's a huge amount of fiber that we're missing out on if we were going to eat paleo then we would have to eat a ton more fiber than we do even now even on a healthy plant-based diet we'd have to probably double or triple the amount of fiber that we're eating which i think is an interesting way of looking at that right um so i'd say what's optimal um is what you feel you can make and what you feel you can enjoy in the, in the confines of mainly whole foods, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, lentils, chickpeas, herbs, spices, nuts and seeds. I can't say there's any data to say that you have to be plant exclusive. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be plant exclusive. But I would say that being plant exclusive can have benefits and it's not something to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. so I guess if we could word it that way yeah I think that's a really good way to word it because you're right when you talk about things like grass-fed beef and raw milk and pasture eggs and stuff it is often associated with like ancestral eating and you're right I think it generally goes back to just pre-processed foods mm -hmm. industry is considered ancestral and but I the thing is though both types of eating or people who are advocating for different ways either plant predominant or, or plant exclusive or eating like a lot of animal food Based foods and just getting it from a better source, right? Than doing factory farm. Both people are on the same page that ultra processed foods are not optimal for us. And so it's really just like tackling and getting down to the nitty gritty of like how many plants should we really be eating? But the way that you explain that about how our physiology is designed to be plant predominant, <laughs> it's very clear about that. And then the way that you're explaining the data too. I think we were talking the other day as well about the seven day adventists you want to talk a little bit about that as yeah well. sure i mean that's an interesting group of people because the seventh day adventists mainly i think based around loma linda in california and they are a health conscious group of people uh, it's part of their faith tradition to want to look after their bodies and be healthy but there will be a mixture of them so some of them would be meat eaters some of them would be vegetarian some of them would be fully vegan and in fact there's a, a significant proportion of Seventh-day Adventists who are fully plant-based and what is interesting is when you look at those Adventist studies you see that there is definitely an increased risk of diabetes increased risk of being overweight, um, carrying excess weight, the more animal products the Adventists ate. So the less that they ate, the more likely they were to have a normal BMI and have a reduced risk of diabetes, whereas the more they ate, even in this health conscious population, the more the risks of having an unhealthy BMI and having diabetes. Yeah, I think that's a really good group to bring up because when you're comparing these ways of life, they're all eating holistically, living holistically too, because a lot of mm. times, you know, there's other factors in regards to our health, in regards to our movement and our sleep and just our consciousness of living well, other than just our food. But all these people are doing that and having very amounts of animal foods down yeah. to none and to exactly. see the difference is really helpful and also just looking at basic population studies like in country there's a country uh, I think it was in Finland they had horrendous rates of heart disease uh, before the second world war um, one of the the largest in the world and they had a big public health campaign and during the second world war meat was really restricted there was rationing um and after the second world war when they did the big public health campaign they were essentially telling the people to eat much less meat and eat loads more veggies uh, obviously to cut smoking and things like that and what they found was that these simple measures helped the people of that country to have vastly reduced rates of heart disease compared to before now you would you would think if you're talking about just being unprocessed and just 
you know, not having factory farmed meats, that that wouldn't make much of a difference. But it made a huge difference to this vast population of people. Heart disease rates dropped dramatically after they were advised and uh, told to eat more vegetables. Right, I think that's a really good point. And now a word from our sponsors. Did you know that you swallow five to 7% of your toothpaste every single time you brush your teeth? That's an entire blob of toothpaste every seven days. Most commercial toothpastes are filled with harsh chemicals, artificial flavors, and preservatives. Not stuff you wanna be putting in your mouth, let alone eating. That's why Bite makes toothpaste tablets made with clean ingredients that are sulfate, palm oil, and glycerin free. And my holistic dentist fully approves. There's a specific ingredient she highly recommends for brushing teeth called hydroxyapatite, and it's in these awesome toothpaste bits. And on top of that, the jars are so pretty. It comes in refillable glass jars, and they send refills in compostable pouches, so they're better for our bodies and our earth. No more plastic toothpaste tubes. Bite toothpaste bits are so convenient. You just pop a bit in your mouth, chew it up, and start brushing. It will turn into paste just like you're used to, but with no plastic tube or messy paste, which makes it extra convenient for kids who think popping a bite in their mouth is so fun and makes toothbrushing time a pleasant experience. It honestly felt a little weird at first, but now my whole family is obsessed. It's so effective and makes my teeth extremely clean. I ran out of bite toothpaste bits once, so I went back to my old regular toothpaste, and very quickly I realized that my teeth didn't feel as clean. So I'm never going back to paste and will be using bite from here on out. Bite makes plastic-free alternatives for everything on your bathroom sink, so you can cut out the harsh chemicals and plastic waste without compromise. And Bite is offering my listeners 20% off your first order. Go to trybite.com slash Ellen or use the code Ellen at checkout to claim this deal. That's T-R-Y-B-I-T-E dot com slash Ellen. We're also brought to you today by Buffy. You guys, I'm telling you, every time a friend or guest lays down in these sheets and comforter, they are blown away by how soft and cozy it is. And I can say without a doubt that Buffy enhances my sleep. So in addition to that, what's so great about Buffy is that they are dedicated to making a positive impact on not only our sleep, but also the environment using only renewable and recycled materials, which makes them as soft on the planet as they are on your bed. Their debut product, the Cloud Comforter, is covered in super soft eucalyptus fabric and filled with fluffy fiber made from 100% recycled bottles. This comforter has over 18,000 five-star reviews. It keeps you at the perfect temperature so you feel cozy without overheating, and it is by far my favorite comforter I've ever slept with. It's hypoallergenic and machine washable thanks to an innovative stitching pattern that keeps its fluffy fill in place. Plus, its high thread count shuts out dust, mold, and mites for a healthier sleep environment. The best part for me, though, is that the average down comforter harms 12 geese, but Buffy's comforter is made cruelty-free. It feels even softer than down while keeping approximately 50 bottles out of landfills and oceans. So use my code Ellen for $20 off orders over $80. You can try a comforter in your own bed for free. If you don't love it, return it at no cost. Maybe maybe they want to respond and be like, well, what about another country who eats a lot of animal foods and they don't have high heart disease risks? Like, how would you respond to that? So I think the most common one that people bring up is uh, the populations of Alaska, where you have primarily fish. Mm-hmm. And what I find interesting about that is when you look at heart disease rates, they are actually pretty high um, and those populations have had to learn to survive in the extremes of human capacity and I think that also draws back on what we were discussing earlier which is it's not so much the diet that we should thrive on but I think humans are designed to survive in a variety of different settings yeah and so you know when it comes to looking at the blood vessels of people from you know these traditionally Alaskan populations or Inuit populations they have you know thickening of their arteries they have a high you know calcium scores things like that potentially because you know they're having all mm-hmm. fish and all yeah. meat products but i wouldn't tell them not to do that because that is their history that is what was available um so i think generally speaking we should have a lot less judgment when it comes to the foods that we choose to eat but also to remember a lot of the time you know humans throughout history have been surviving you know there have been huge amounts of nutritional deficiencies in our ancestors um in the uk for example looking at um, thyroid function and iodine levels there was a condition called lancashire neck which happened when 
um, people in from parts of the world called Lancashire, which is in the UK, didn't have enough iodine because there was not enough iodine in the soil and they were having a lot of potatoes and things that were grown in um, iodine-depleted soils. And so they developed goiter, which is where the, the thyroid gland swells up and it causes issues with the thyroid function. And it was actually called Lancashire Neck because in that part of the world there was less um, iodine within the soil. Is that optimal? Is that ancestral? Yeah. Well, not really. Is it ancestral? Well, maybe because that's what the, you know. That's what yeah. the ancestors. How there long ate. ago was that? Was that like pre-processed food industry? Of course. Yeah. So this is the thing. I think a lot of times people. I love all these examples you're bringing up. A lot of times people want to blame one thing, like oh, it's it's a seed oils or it's sugar or it's oil or whatever, right? Like. And I get that, and those it may be those things part of it, but there, it's not just like one thing. There's a lot of different factors that create good health. And I think that's such a good point to say that just because our ancestors ate a certain way doesn't mean that they were actually thriving. Because living to survive is what our species had to do as they traveled across different lands. And I think this is the perfect example with that for dairy that people kind of when people try to say that dairy is part of our physiology well we know that it's not because it's designed for a baby calf to grow into a great big cow um but on top of that layer if you're talking about ancestrally like having cows and dairy was a significant food source when you're traveling to a different land where you don't know what the food source is going to be like and to be able to have that something that's filling and does have nutrients in it it makes sense why that happened throughout our history and our ancestry it completely <laughs> makes sense yeah it you doesn't know, mean that's how we were designed to thrive it completely makes sense that we would have had dairy because as you say in certain parts of europe um in the winter months people were not going to be able to have access to those nutritional <clears throat> delicious foods and so they would have relied on dairy as a great stop gap and it would have contained lots of different nutrients that they would have needed to survive yep. but that doesn't mean that they would necessarily have thrived that way so we're so fortunate that in this time in, in human history we have access to a lot of different healthy foods most of us um, and I think in a way the debates around ancestral diets or paleo diets or vegan diets or keto diets is, is actually quite it's difficult for me because what I see day to day is people struggling people on the red line people who need to use food banks. And I find these questions sometimes difficult because I think most people are literally just trying to think one day to the next, how am I gonna feed my family? Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, if they have the mental bandwidth to bulk buy grains or legumes or learn to cook them, then that is gonna be probably the cheapest way for them to be able to provide optimal nutrition for their families. Yes. And I think that's the discussion that many of us should be having rather than, oh, well, what ifs or what yeah. about? You yes, know? Yeah. I think that's such a good point. It's so true. And what, that's something that is actually quite beautiful about the plant based diet or plant predominant diet that, you know, it is quite affordable when you're eating whole foods based like the beans and rice as a staple because they are very low in calories, especially when you're cooking from scratch. Um, like the dried beans it's so so cheap <laughs> it's very cheap yeah it's, it's the well it's, it's a staple food for many populations around the globe for a reason yeah you know there's and there's a lot of good nutrients in there soaking and sprouting helps because it helps to uh, reduce those completely natural compounds in plants oxalates um, phytates which as I say completely natural in all plants nothing wrong with them but sometimes they can slightly inhibit some of the absorption of other minerals like mm -hmm. iron so soaking and sprouting of grains and and beans has been really common ancestrally mm -hmm. again is so is that ancestral diet well yes it is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> many people have had to do that over the years to make sure they optimize the amount of nutrition they get from these amazing foods i think that's all those are all such great points and i love just how well that you and other plant-based doctors talk about the wide body of evidence of of eating predominantly plant-based or, or whole foods plant-based um, to help set our set ourselves up to help prevent and lower our risk of heart disease and cancers and certain things like that. So what you said about beans and rice, it makes me think of subsidies and how animal foods should be significantly more expensive if we didn't have the subsidies that are in place, at least in America today. Mm -hmm. Well, they should be, I suppose, if you, if you take all the costs into account, including environmental costs and including the cost of of what it would take to ethically raise an animal um, and you know what that involves. So yeah, it would be a lot more expensive if it was the real cost. Right. Um, but you're asking me about data and I think what's interesting is, you know, when you look at children, there's not many studies that would actively put a diet in place for a child, but you can look at people who in different populations have used 
different forms of nutrition and analyze it that way. I think probably the best, um, or at least I say best, the most interesting and accurate studies have actually recently come out of Germany. There's a, there's a big one called the Vici study where they enrolled children from the year sort of 2016 to 2018. And there's been a couple of really good papers as a result of this big study, which I hope will reassure parents that are vegan that it would be a really lovely idea to raise your children vegan too and not to feel scared about it uh, because like the first study I'll mention is um, for children sort of age one to three which is that sort of typical toddler age and what they did was they had 127 children that that were vegan in Germany and they analyzed their micronutrient intakes and uh, they wanted to see you know were there any gaps what, how was it you know, how was it for the children and what was interesting is that there were absolutely no differences in the height no differences in the weight um, between the vegan children and the omnivorous children in this particular study group uh, both sets of children had plenty of protein I know that's always a big question for a lot of people is where do they get their protein well you can get it from plenty of places and they both had plenty of protein the vegan children had more fiber which is a really important thing for reducing constipation which is a really big problem for a lot of kids mm. it's a lot of what I see in clinic actually is children suffering from severe constipation which is an awful um, situation to be in for children. So yeah, they had more fiber. And interestingly, they actually had more micronutrients as well um, mm. on balance. So they had more vitamin E, more vitamin B1, more folate, uh, more vitamin C, more magnesium. Uh, so yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting study. Now, when you look at the, um, if there was any kind of patterns to it, the omnivorous children generally had a little bit more in the way of things like zinc um, and DHA and iodine, but the vegan children were not deficient mm. in any of those things on average. Um, and there's plenty of ways to get those things. So if you know where the key nutrients are, you can find yourself in a position where your child actually has more of most micronutrients compared to the standard way of eating. That's so great. I think that there's a couple of things I want to say in response to that. I think this type of information is really helpful because like you said, sometimes parents are concerned about raising their kids plant-based. And I think the majority of it is from kind of the fear propaganda campaign mm. that it happens just in regards to our media and um, even just well-meaning parents and what we have been taught growing up. Like I was definitely taught that I needed these foods to be healthy, like animal foods when I was young. Mm. And by kind of unlearning what we're taught as a generational just understanding to looking at the evidence I think that's that's really really helpful for parents and the other aspect is these specific nutrients that you're talking about I know a lot of people want to know and have questions about specific nutrients so mm -hmm. should we get into that I'm Let's get into I'm it so, I'm so excited <laughs> to talk about this and also I want to touch on breastfeeding which we'll get there we'll, I know get into gonna, it yeah I'm like we we're gonna go talk there. it at the beginning but I'm like wait we have so many things to talk about <laughs> I, know. I know there's so many things we can discuss but we can get into it so one of the things I forgot to say actually is what I found from the study reading it was that the vegan children, they also had much higher vitamin B12 levels. Oh, that's oh isn't, so, isn't that, that is interesting? Interesting. That is very interesting. Let's put the, I'll put the link to that study below for people to check out. You can get that one for me. That sounds like yeah. a really interesting study. It is. Um, so the reason why the vegan children had higher vitamin B12 is because their parents supplemented. Yeah. And I do think it's important to say if you're fully plant-based that a B12 supplement is something that's important for yeah, um, a for vegan sure. lifestyle. Um, but looking at the other nutrients, I guess, um, you know, we could start with things like iron. Uh, that's a common one of focus. And maybe try and remember BLT, not bacon, lettuce, tomato, but um, <laughs> beans, lentils and tofu. Mm. Those are great sources of plant based iron and protein. Uh, and it's nice to remember, OK, if you're at the supermarket, think, OK, BLT, I'm going to make sure I go down, <laughs> get myself some beans, get myself some um, lentils, maybe get some uh, like calcium um, uh, tofu so that you've got extra calcium there as well. Um, and it's just a nice aid memoir for parents. But there's loads of sources of iron. Um, and interestingly, if you have vitamin C with your iron, it can increase the absorption between two and four times. So when you're thinking about feeding your children, you think, OK, well, if I have a lentil bolognese, I'll have some broccoli on the side because I've got the vitamin C, which will help absorb the iron mm -hmm. from 
uh, the lentils or something also like citrus like lemon or lime on a salad like exactly. a green salad or f- orange juice fresh orange juice in a smoothie with collard greens exactly so, yeah. it really helps the absorption or if you have oatmeal make sure that you maybe put something like strawberries or kiwi on top to help increase the vitamin c concentration with your iron rich foods which makes your food beautiful anyways and yeah. all this stuff all this stuff that you're talking about makes your food more beautiful and appealing as well exactly exactly <laughs> but it's, it's just a nice thing to think okay where's my vitamin c where's my iron and make sure you can get it and essentially these minerals are abundant in a lot of plant-based foods uh, but it's just i think variety is is great so if you have a nice variety then you know okay i'm going to get everything i need and that includes things like selenium um as well and zinc Uh, again for zinc you could think um beans again lentils again um oats are a great source of zinc Um, pumpkin seeds right pumpkin seeds Mm -hmm. chickpeas Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think maybe remember for iron, you've got your BLT, maybe zinc, you've got block, B-L-O-C. So you've got beans, lentils, oats, chickpeas, and pumpkin seeds, as you mentioned. So, there's, I mean, there's, but there's a ton. Like if you go online, you could literally see a massive list of, of vegan sources of these things. But sometimes it's nice to have that little aid memoir. Yeah. So that you know, okay, right. I'm going to make sure I'm having that. And also just a lot of this stuff just revolves around whole plant foods. It's really mm-hmm. easy in our modern day world to get um, into a rut of just buying more processed foods, even if it is maybe less ultra processed but it is still processed foods because it says vegan on it and it's plant-based but the more whole foods that all these foods you're mentioning that we can get into our family's home Mm. and into our diet is just going to help ensure all those nutrient profiles and i think it's important to say too as we're talking about specific nutrients that every diet whether rich in animal foods or rich in plants has nutrients of focus to focus on so while we're talking about plant predominant or plant-based kids Let's keep going with these yeah. specific nutrients. And it's, impo- it's it's good that you said that, Ellen, because the fact that we're talking about key nutrients of focus, I don't want people to think, oh, well, that means that this is something that, you know, other people don't have to think about. Mm-hmm. There are other nutrients of focus on a meat-heavy diet, for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, magnesium and folate, and potassium, all the things I mentioned from the Vici study um, will be potentially lower if you're not really thinking about what you're giving your, ch- totally. your children. Totally. So. And all these um, these diets that are advocating for more like um, ancestral way, Western A price or um, paleo or anything like that, they most of them are still taking some form of supplement as well. So sometimes people will say, oh, if you need a B12 supplement, then that means that you shouldn't be totally plant based. But I mean, they're even injecting B12 into farm animals these days. Yeah, <laughs> that's a really important point. You know, we are all supplementing or fortifying in ways that we don't realize. Mm-hmm. In fact, I don't know if it's the same in the US, but in the UK, um, our bread is fortified with B vitamins, thiamine, things like that. Um, our we're, we're fortunate enough to have many plant milks that are fortified as well, which I think is actually a really great option if you're raising plant-based kids, is to look at the label and double check, is my plant milk fortified? Because that's a lovely way of, of making sure I don't have to think as hard and I know that they're getting vitamin D, getting iodine, you know, getting calcium, because cow milks are also fortified. And the, the iodine doesn't come naturally in cow's milk. It's used in the cleansing of the vats that they use to collect the milk. Mm. And so why is that more natural than having a plant milk with iodine yeah, supplementation? That's interesting. I think we live in a modern world that just like sometimes requires that type of fortification. It doesn't mean it always needs to be the case. Like I think that's a great example for people who want to not think about it as hard or don't maybe live in a place where they can garden and get, you know, food from the farmer's market as often as someone like ourselves who has the opportunity to get most of our plants from like really nutrient rich soil. But if you don't have that opportunity and you live in a faster paced world, like it does make sense to be able to that adding something like that. Um, Do you want to talk about that study you were talking about with the fortified milk? Oh, yeah. Well, I was talking about a pediatric nutrition, a, a pediatric dietitian who um, did a presentation, which I watched. And it was fascinating because she laid out some really simple foods that a vegan toddler would have, uh, you know, things like carrot sticks and hummus and oatmeal and, like, you know, maybe a bean dish. Um, and uh, what she found is that when you give the toddler the same meal, but instead you use fortified products like fortified milk, basically, to make the oatmeal or a small glass of fortified milk as part of their daily routine. Then it immediately plugged any issues with regard to things like iodine uh, or B12 or selenium intake. So it's just a really lovely way of knowing 
if you are not able to mm-hmm. you know focus so hard on making yeah. sure that you're going and getting all of these sort of natural organic products yeah. that okay my child's gonna yeah. have this and that from their plant milk and, and it's just it's an easy win yeah i think it's really helpful to provide different perspectives of different ways of approaching a plant-based diet because like the way that you're describing not everybody has the same kind of lifestyle as someone like myself where i like really love and appreciate to be eating as much whole foods as we can and not really so much fortified stuff so for me i make my own plant milk but we also my kids Kids eat dulse every week, all throughout the week, which is rich in iodine. And or I say, I normally say iodine, but like because I heard you say Sorry. iodine. We're both saying iodine. Yeah, yeah, I love it. <laughs> okay. I love it. But, you can um, talk British for a yeah, while. Yeah, but there's like, <laughs> I, I I tend to do that when I'm around like a friend for a long time. I start to adapt to their mannerisms or the way that they talk. Um, but yeah, so certain there's nutrients of focus that like I really love to get from whole food sources instead of doing which is like, great. Or, yeah, which is great because I optimal. love I just love to make things from scratch and I love for my kids to be part of the process and so we do a lot of uh, sea veggie dulse um so my kid I, I feel confident that my kids are getting their iodine covered as like a specific yes. example but for someone who's like my kid doesn't like dulse or I don't have time to make salads every day for my kids that is a really great alternative for what it you're is. saying it is yeah and it's also important to know you know when it comes to iodine Many people are iodine deficient globally. It's one of the, when iron is probably one of the biggest deficiencies globally. Iodine is also really uh, very significant. And um, again, this is not vegan populations. This is generally, uh, mm-hmm. a lot of people are iodine deficient. Mm-hmm. So it's just important to be aware of iodine sources. And nori sheets are great because you can use those to make sushi rolls. You can use them um, just as a snack. Uh, and they have a pretty decent amount of iodine in them. But... I would say be cautious when it comes to all different kinds of sea plants like um, uh, kelp for example can sometimes have a lot of iodine mm-hmm. and it's a bit like Goldilocks you know you don't want to have too much of it exactly as well as not having uh, yeah. too little right so if you're unsure and your kids don't enjoy nori sheets or dulse. You know, dulse flakes or whatever yeah. else um, it's okay to just include it in a yeah. nut milk or in a supplement a non seaweed based supplement is okay um, yeah and they often come in multivit anyway for kids. So. And this goes for anyone who's listening who aren't even maybe raising their kids plant-based, but they just want to get 100%. more just nutrition in their family's diet. And yeah. so like you were saying, like with the iodine just being something, a key nutrient focus for anyone on any exactly. diet. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so for us, like with something like selenium, we include like a Brazil nut here or there every once in a while throughout our like uh, homemade granolas that we make. I just like to make a lot of foods from scratch. But again, just prefacing for those who don't have the time for that and want to cover their needs, I love the way that you're approaching that yeah. and taking into consideration from that because you probably see all kinds of people in your practice. I see all kinds and many people that really don't have the mental bandwidth. Mm-hmm. And luckily, you know, you, you have such an incredible lifestyle and mm-hmm. your followers will obviously be emulating a lot of the things you do. And I would agree totally that whole foods... Um, and more of a conscious thought behind what you're eating is is just incredible and mm-hmm. is the way to go. But, um, you know, everybody's quite different yeah. when it comes to their family lives and stuff like that. So, and different work lives too. Like, and, work and, lives, and there's no yeah. shame in that. There's yeah. literally no need to try to compare. I think comparison is a thief of joy. Mm-hmm. And that's why, it, I think that's one of the my favorite statements. Unless ever. you're inspired. Unle- yeah, right. <laughs> You've got to have a good feeling that comes from comparing. Right. Like, wow, that is so great. Yeah. I'd love to do that. I'm going to start doing right. this or that. <laughs> yeah, I guess I look at it more as like I'm looking at someone and what am I inspired by them as opposed yeah. to comparing themselves to myself, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, the different lifestyles really are important to preface for people. Let's talk about K2. Yeah, so well, we, we talked about selenium and Brazil nuts. Hopefully people will pick up on that. Yeah. Uh, Brazil nuts are great and one a day for adults is, is great. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but you can also get selenium from other things like oats. And it's interesting so, how so many of the plant-based foods, essentially, if you're just combining mm-hmm. um, various whole grains and legumes, you're going to have a lot of the different minerals too, right? including selenium. And that's why I love what um, Dr. Will Bolsowitz talks about, the wide variety of plant-based diversity. Because if yes. you're like getting a diversity, if, if you're just eating the same kind of beans, the same kind of oats, and the same couple of fruits throughout your week every single week, like you're less likely to cover all those bases if you're just getting a variety of different kinds of beans different yeah. kinds of grains anyway yeah definitely ahead. so yeah. that's that's one take home for everyone is variety is great mm-hmm. great for the gut and great for your micronutrient intake um so you talked about you mentioned k2 so yeah k vitamin is important you know, it helps with um blood um clotting it also helps with calcium metabolism now interestingly children in many parts of the world are vitamin k deficient mm. whatever they eat 
That's interesting. So in the UK, um, we are advised uh, to let parents know that um, vitamin K supplementation under the age of five is is preferable. There's actually a vitamin um, or vitamin. Uh, it's, it's called Abidec and it contains um, vitamin A, uh, vitamin K and vitamin D. Uh, and it's advised for all children under five. So again, it's actually, you know, when you're looking at large populations of people, whatever they're eating, there is... Mm -hmm. There are certain gaps exactly. there yeah. that, that may be good to fill. So when it comes to vitamin K1, you can get that from leafy greens. When it comes to K2, you can get it either from animal products or fermented foods. So if you are having a fermented food-rich diet, things like um, miso is great mm -hmm. uh, for providing K2. Uh, natto is, but I have to say I've never tried it, and people say it doesn't taste great. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say focusing on fermented foods, if you wanted to get a natural source of uh, vitamin K2, is a good idea. But also there's so much more to it. I think good gut health, again, maybe going back to your episode with Dr. B, good gut health is so great because it helps your gut bugs to manufacture certain items that, that you would otherwise be missing. Mm -hmm. And so are we more vitamin K deficient because we live in a world where we use a lot of antibiotics, where we use a lot of pesticides, where our gut microbes are perhaps um, not going to be as efficient at helping us to make these things. So K, there's actually about 12 different subtypes of vitamin K and many of them can be manufactured with a healthy gut microbiome. But how are we going to know? Like, I think that is such a good point because mm. oftentimes it feels a little bit tedious and odd to be focusing so hyper on like specific nutrients sometimes. Like, yeah. where am I going to get this exact nutrient? What about this nutrient? Am I, am I going to like experience all these issues if I don't have this exact one? But I think the whole the holistic approach of our lifestyles really plays a role. Like you were mm. talking about with our gut health and stress can affect your gut optimization Completely. as well so yeah. looking at your lifestyle with your children as well like yeah. since this episode is about children like are they getting restful sleep are we making sure their sleep is a priority where they hopefully get to sleep in get to bed early enough going to bed with full tummy so they sleep really well mm -hmm. you know all all of those types of things helping to lower the stress in your own life so that you can be a more calm parent so that they're less stressed out and high strung so you true. want them to feel balanced and they're gonna just do a lot better that way it's so true ellen it's so true there are so many different different factors that essentially involve a healthy happy life mm -hmm. that would also help us um to to include those different nutrients without getting so specific yeah um but yeah our gut bugs they pretty much they help us to absorb the right amount of protein from our food they help mm -hmm. us to make thiamine and vitamin k and, and vitamin b12 mm -hmm. and a lot of other different um polyphenols they, yes. they help to assimilate those as well yes um and so you have to decide i suppose as a family you know has my has my son or daughter had a lot of antibiotics when they were a young baby you know if you if you have um if you've had a cesarean or if you've um, not uh, had the opportunity to breastfeed um, or if your child had sepsis or some other serious infection where they had multiple courses of antibiotics, those things will play a part um, in making sort of the decision around, you know, how to optimize nutrition. Uh, and so including lots of plant-based foods, including fermented foods, is going to be particularly helpful for those children. Yeah, my kids love sauerkraut. We like to make our own sauerkraut when we have the time, but if not, we'll just buy sauerkraut. Also, coconut yogurt is a mm -hmm. great option as well. Yeah, or sourdough coconut yogurt, bread. which already has. Exactly, yeah. it has those probiotics in, which is great. Mm -hmm. and, and there's so many. You know, sourdough you mentioned as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I think that's a really great point in regards to the specific nutrients and how it all plays a role. A lot of times we can get very obsessed as humans with the reductionist looking looking at things in a reductionist lens yeah. rather than holistically and how everything plays a role to how we absorb nutrients even. It's true. Yeah, and Don't even step looking back. at foods um, as a whole instead of going, oh, I'm only eating dolls for iodine. Like, well, th it's good for a lot of different reasons too. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I think it's about it's about understanding, you know, your whole life and where you know where you might find that with children you've mentioned good sleep is important moving their bodies is important i mean even things like spending time in nature can impact their skin microbiome things like that mm -hmm. um so yeah it's not just down to individual nutrients a lot of the time but it hopefully will improve parents confidence mm -hmm. especially when they're you know going fully plant-based to know that they, they can get all the things that they need from certain yeah. things yeah yeah and then on top of that like simplifying your life trying to yeah. and that's oh, that's what I love too about a lot of the parenting books that I read I don't know if you read much on like um respectful parenting conscious parenting and all that but um Shivali Saberi is someone I interviewed who is all about just like simplifying your life and just not 
creating such a stressful life with your kids and that that's helpful not only just for their mental health but their physical health as well yeah Yeah, definitely I haven't I'd like to read more than that but it does make a lot of sense yeah for sure Mm. so I have a question going back a little bit to b12 is there a specific type of b12 you recommend for parents most of the studies we have are on cyanocobalamin being perfectly adequate I know there are some Um, who prefer methylcobalamin because it's said to be more bioavailable, but we have plenty of evidence to say that cyanocobalamin is just as bioavailable. Mm -hmm. I think um, the requirements for B12 differ depending on how frequently you have it. So, but because the absorption changes. So if you have like one microgram of vitamin B12 from a fortified food, then you're going to absorb about half of that. Whereas if you have a 2000 microgram supplement once a week, you only absorb a small fraction of it, but it's enough. Mm -hmm. So the amount that you absorb differs depending on how frequently Mm -hmm. you have. Yeah, people actually really want to know about, I get a lot of questions from parents that I'm like, let's talk to a physician about that, like specific (laughs) amounts. So what would you recommend for people based on their age differences, if they're taking cyacobalamin or methylcobalamin, either one? Well, to keep things simple, I'd say to parents, just get yourself a B12 supplement and read the packet and whatever the packet says to give your child you give your child that Mm. that keeps it simple yeah Um, but generally speaking if you're an adult and you are having fortified foods like um, fortified nut milks or cereals or margarines or um, brewer's yeast like marmite in the uk or vegemite in australia these are all sources of b12 that you can have in your diet nutritional yeast as well so if you have um those two or three times a day you only need about three micrograms Hmm. if you have a supplement once a day and don't think about it then 10 micrograms is the dose so remember what i said if you if you're having it two or three times you only need smaller amounts whereas if you have it once you need 10 micrograms now Mm -hmm. actually 10 micrograms is still a tiny amount Mm -hmm. but you just still do need it right now babies and young children it would be much less than that but again if you're having it daily, that's different from if you're having it once a week. How young do you recommend parents start children on B12 if they're eating a plant-based diet? So if you are a mum of a baby and you're breastfeeding the baby, you need to make sure you have the B12 in your breast milk. So I think a good sort of solid 10 microgram supplement a day is is good. For yourself. For yourself. Yes, let's make that clear. Yeah, for yourself. And then, <laughs> yeah. then it can pass through into the breast milk. And then once your baby is beginning to wean, yeah, you start them on a B12 supplement. Um, and many of the childhood supplements are combined. So you don't have to be like figuring out what drops to give. It's literally a lot of them, you just have one set of drops and it has B12. Um, it could have things like you know iodine or selenium or whatever else you want to have in the drops and multivitamin drops. Mm. Um, but yeah, it can be sort of 0. Point, I think it's like 0. 0.9 micrograms a day. Um, one microgram a day when they're a bit older, maybe a toddler, one and a half micrograms as they get a bit older, sort of the five plus range. That's the kind of sort of range you're looking at. They're very, very small amounts, but they are vital. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, I think that's really helpful for parents. Um, My next specific nutrient that I want to ask about is omega-3 and DHA, ALA. Can we talk a little bit about that and your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. So we we know from a lot of studies that dha so okay let's break it down omega-3s are really important fatty acids we can't make them in our own bodies so we have to consume them and in plant sources they come in short chain form or ala it's called and you can get those from hemp seeds chia seeds flax seeds walnuts these are all amazing sources of of short chain omega-3 fatty acids or ala now the long chain omega-3 fatty acids are called EPA and DHA. And you tend to get those from um, algae or algae or fish. They tend to be the biggest sources of the long chain omega-3s. Now, when we consume plant-based omega-3s in ALA form, uh, we don't always convert it to the long chain form. Uh, With the EPA, you can convert about 20% of it. DHA on average, it's really small, about 1% conversion rate based on what we know. So a lot of people say, okay, well, if you can't make that much of it, then maybe you should go for, maybe you have to eat fish. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'd say that that's not the case. We don't have any data to suggest that people on um, long-term vegetarian or vegan diets have any issues with brain health. In fact, the opposite is true. Um, 
like long-term healthy plant-based diets have been shown to be fantastic for reducing risk of dementia mm-hmm. um, and there's you know there's absolutely no evidence to suggest there's any problem having said that given that we know that dha is great for baby's brain development and for human brain development i personally like to advise parents to consider an epa dha supplement for kids just to be on the safe side because we don't always know what we don't know Mm -hmm. um so i personally give my children an epa and dha algae based supplement or algae based supplement Mm -hmm. because that's where fish get it from Mm -hmm. it always comes back to plants at the end of the day it does it's the same with b12 b12 is made by microbes it's not made by animals Mm -hmm. and you know the um the right sort of epa dha um, long chain omega-3s are made by sea plants mm-hmm. algae or yeah. algae so i like to give them that purest form of ready available long chain omega-3s but we don't have guidelines to say that that's necessary right so it's kind of up to the parents it's idea parents. based on what they're hearing exactly and yeah. i'd say you know if you have if you're very conscious about making sure you have like multiple sources of uh, flax seeds chia seeds hemp seeds walnuts in good amounts mm-hmm. in your child's diet uh then you know, yeah. I'm sure that the plant-based sources are fine. Yeah, that I, is I, what we do. That's what you do. Yeah, we, we've we never given our kids like a DHA supplement. We've always done a lot of hemp seeds and flax seeds. Um, we, I, sometimes I'll add even up to like a quarter cup into my smoothies. I, I add up plenty of flax seeds into my smoothies and hemp seeds into our kids' smoothies every single day. We put it on salads. Um, I put it in dressings and we, we just incorporate it in a lot of different ways. And then our granolas, because I make a really great homemade granola that has hemp seeds in it and we do like a whole half a cup in the batch and then we also add use flax seeds ground flax seeds into our muffins and things like that so we our kids eat a lot of hemp seeds on a daily basis hemp seeds and flax seeds chia amazing yeah so um we've done well with that but i like the different again the options and the different it's good to have ways options. of living yeah because yeah. you know maybe your kid doesn't like hemp seeds i don't know <laughs> <laughs> exactly but if you're aware okay yeah. hemp seeds flax seeds chia seeds walnuts making them a daily thing yeah is fantastic yeah. and especially as you mentioned milling those uh flax seeds mm-hmm. because you don't necessarily get the same nutrients yeah. if they are going straight through your gut yeah and you know you're not necessarily assimilating that so yeah plenty of plant-based omega-3s um i generally like to advise the supplement because yeah. i am erring on the side of yeah caution. And, uh, which is good it's just, it's a great <laughs> it's a great thing i love ha- having all different kinds of perspectives to bring for different people and i think sometimes people can be like okay omega-3s i'll do one teaspoon of hemp seeds into my smoothies but really like with my kids when i'm making a batch of smoothie for my kids i'll do like a quarter cup sometimes half a cup of hemp seeds like in a smoothie for my three or four children yeah yeah, yeah you so, need you need big amounts you, and need, that's good. you exactly. need lots of it yeah so don't be afraid of them yeah <laughs> i think we covered oh i think one other nutrient of focus we could talk about is maybe calcium and bone health for kids mm. what, what are your thoughts on that yeah so calcium is i would say generally aim for slightly higher than the recommended uh nutritional intake for things like calcium and the same for things like iron as we talked about before um just because we want to make sure because the the nutritional guidelines are based on a standard american diet or a standard western style diet and do you think I, that's a good thing? Do you think it should be like that? I don't know if it should be, but that's the way it is because that's <laughs> what most people eat. Yeah. Um, but so with that in mind, yeah. if you're thinking more about a plant-based uh, diet, then we, you know, we have got the oxalates and the phytates, which are completely natural, um, <laughs> but they can sometimes mean that you slightly you know, do absorb slightly less. So I would say on a plant-based diet, those those recommended nutritional intakes could be slightly elevated. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be aiming to have a bit more calcium or a little bit more iron than you would otherwise think of. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, calcium is important for bone health and it's available from a number of different sources. Uh, Green veggies are great. Not so much spinach. Spinach, um, it's hard to actually absorb the calcium in spinach, but thinking of like broccoli or bok choy or lettuce or cabbage, these are great sources of bioavailable calcium. And in fact, broccoli has more bioavailable calcium than cow's milk, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, you can get it from like, things like dried apricots, dried figs, uh, nut butters, almonds. You know, There's actually a ton of different sources of calcium that you could hopefully incorporate into your child's diet, which will allow them to have plenty of calcium. Mm. And interestingly, we didn't touch on vitamin D yet, but vitamin D helps to improve calcium absorption. 
And vitamin D is something else that I would generally advise people to supplement, whatever mm -hmm. their dietary pattern, because it's hard to get through your food. We tend to make it through our skin with sunlight exposure. And I would love to live in Hawaii. Yeah. I'd love to be in Maui, <laughs> yeah. sunning myself. Yes. Um, but alas, most of us, uh, especially where I live, um, there's not so much sun. And it's quite hard to make yeah. enough vitamin D, whatever our dietary pattern. So mm -hmm. I personally say, take a vitamin D supplement, that will help you to absorb even more of the calcium that you're eating in your diet, which will be a great thing. There sounds like then there's like three, maybe I missed one, but three specific supplements you recommend for kids just as a general to cover your bases. Uh, well, first the fortified plant milks, if you're wanting to do that, as opposed to making more things from scratch and then the B12. And then there was the DHA, the algae based DHA, and then the vitamin D. Yeah. Yeah. And interestingly, if you're having consciously fortified plant milks, you don't necessarily need to supplement vitamin D mm -hmm. because it will be contained, depending on how much they drink, right. it will be contained in that. And, you know, even for people who live in tropical environments, it's just our, our modernized world. A lot of people are living indoors all mm -hmm. day and we're not living outside near as much as we used to yeah. as a species. Yeah. And so it, it really comes down to your lifestyle yeah. in, in addition to where you're living in your climate. It's true, your lifestyle <laughs> yeah. and your climate. Yeah. And if you have a darker skin tone, it's going to take longer to be in the sun mm -hmm. to, to make enough vitamin D. Right. So if you have pasty white skin then you know in the UK in the middle of summer you're going to be wanting about 10-15 minutes of direct sunlight to the face and hands to make enough right every day and on top of that most people are slathering sunscreen on at every not saying that that's a bad thing but um when you take that into account as it well also, it lowers your absorption of vitamin d it certainly does <laughs> Uh, and then if you have darker skin, many people from other uh, ancestral climates, they will come and have real issues getting enough vitamin D, certainly in British weather, right. <laughs> probably in many other parts of the US or Canada as well, right. because darker skin tone means they're not going to absorb as much vitamin D, so it may take even longer to get enough. So just take a supplement. Yeah. Everyone. Do you feel that way for people <laughs> who aren't eating plant-based as well about vitamin D? I do. That's why I say everyone. Everyone, yeah. And it doesn't matter. And we're talking <clears throat> specifically plant-based here because that's what we're interested in and yeah. that's what we want to encourage parents to feel reassured that they can do. Mm -hmm. But this is true across the board. And it's like what I mentioned earlier with certain other nutrients of focus. Across the board, whatever they eat, mm -hmm. many people are in fact vitamin B12 deficient. And mm -hmm. interestingly, with the study I mentioned, it was the vegan children that had the most because their parents supplemented. Right. Whereas, you know, many people, if we're going on to adults now, you know, if you're over the age of 50 or if you have diabetes and you're on um, diabetes medications, if you're on um, antacid medications, uh, you're going to not be absorbing as much yeah. vitamin B12 as you need. And you probably will need a supplement, right. whatever you're eating. And then on top of it, the stress-filled stress, li stress lifestyle that we as a society live in. I, I really think it's important to go back to that study you were talking about, or not study, you were talking about um, ancestrally. It was in Ireland where they were iodine deficient. What Lancashire. Le okay, I don't know how to say that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it really, I think a lot of times... Um, um, holistic families who have a really holistic approach and wanting to do things naturally, which I am all about, as you can very much tell. Um, but sometimes it can get to such a point where, where people can want to be resistant to any kind of modernized way of maybe doing food because you think, well, there must be a way to do without any kind of modernized um, way of even like healthcare, right? And dentistry, which I do want to get into teeth health. Um, but sometimes if you get too far back where you just want to think, well, the way that we used to be must have been optimal and perfect and we never needed supplements back then, it's just not the case. No. Like even people before processed foods industry and people were eating whole foods had nutrient deficiencies for this, that, or the other reason. So I think it's really important to take all that into consideration and not... Um, um, maybe be so rigid as we sometimes want to be like yeah. the natural yeah it, it makes sense and even you mentioned dental health even things like making sure that you you know your child learns to clean their teeth properly right? yes yes that's really important oh i'm so excited to talk about this i get questions a lot about that wait did we finish the supplement thing should we go into it uh, i think we something? did so b12 is an absolute must vitamin d is a must for everyone regardless yeah. of what they're eating children under five General guidelines are that they should supplement uh, vitamin A and vitamin K and vitamin D, which in the UK comes in a simple supplement form. In the US, I'm sure there's something equivalent. Again, whatever they are eating, 
That's mm. the interesting point I want to make to you. So yeah. it's not specific to plant-based diets. Yes. Um, yeah, that's interesting about the vitamin A, whatever they're eating. Why are they recommending? Like, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Because sometimes people like to say a plant-based diet, beta carotene, it's not real vitamin A, even though, yeah, why don't you talk about the studies in regards to beta carotene and vitamin A It's just conversion. basically the guidelines in the UK are there based on uh, population patterns over a long time yeah. and the studies that they have on childhood nutrition. There are a few gaps for most people. Right. So they just want to make right. sure that... Well, yeah, well, part of that could be also because there's so much um, nutritional deficiency based on the standard Amer- standard way of eating in mm. Britain and America as mm-hmm. well. But if you're being really conscious, like... I it wouldn't say it's like, essential right. for a yeah. plant-based family to worry. Right. But it's just what the guidelines say. It's yeah, like, and you know, you're erring on the side of caution. Yes, exactly. Yes. So it's like any nutritional guideline is based on most populations. Like in the UK, we have the Eat Well Guide, mm-hmm. and that's focused on five or more portions of fruits and veggies, Mm -hmm. making sure that you base your meals on whole grains and starchy carbohydrates, making sure that you include more plant sources of protein like beans and lentils, Mm -hmm. making sure you have less processed meat, less salt, less sugar, you know, less yeah. saturated fat. These are common sense guidelines based yeah. on years of observations of yes. populations. Right. So, you know, it's, it is a little bit jarring when I see people say, well, you know, that's wrong or that's kind of biased. Maybe it's mm-hmm. different in the US. Maybe there's more of an influence with mm-hmm. um, food companies having a say in how the guidelines are, yeah. are made. But in the UK, that's far less likely. And in the Canadian food guidelines, again, that is not influenced by industry at all. Right. And they really talk about how important it is, is to have a predominantly plant-based plate. You know, they don't include dairy. Mm-hmm. They say like, lots of water, whole grains, beans, lentils, peas, vegetables, yes. fruits. These are the real focus yes. of their guidelines. And there's no industry bias there whatsoever. I'm so glad you brought up Canada because I remember seeing that come out and how integral and important that is to note because we do have food industry um, influence in America. But what I am seeing from like um, a different end of the spectrum type of way of eating, like more Western A. Price ancestral, they kind of tend to think it's the opposite, that it's like vegan propaganda that's influencing the ad, like what's being advised to eat, to eat more vegetables and plants and fruits and beans and stuff which is just astounding to me because the animal agriculture industry is huge in America and just showing that and the influence that it has in their lobbying power so when you consider what happened in Canada without the influence and how it showed it was actually a plant predominant diet and having less animal foods more plants that that's what what the outcome was so that says a lot and it's true for many other countries guidelines and it's that way for a reason you know people mm-hmm. make nutrition and dietetics their career you know people people look at these studies for tens of, of years and like decades if you yeah. look at all of the different people that create these guidelines it's that way for a reason it's yeah it's, yeah, it's just the logical it's fascinating way of doing it. <laughs> i think um going back to the vitamin d thing really quick we don't supplement with vitamin d but we also have we do a lot of sunshine in the tropics and we also we use sunscreen but like in a very methodical way like we if we're going out in the sun for a 45 minute period of time with the kids or when we're gardening and they don't have their shirts on they get their vitamin d that way without sunscreen on but if we're going to the beach for two three hours we put sunscreen on all of us and so logical so it's like a balanced approach where like we're making sure they're getting their bare skin our bare skin in the sun without sunscreen for a period of time but not an excess yeah you're right i mean that's that's a great way of looking at it you don't want you obviously don't want your child to burn Mm -hmm. that's the number one thing you want to avoid yeah Yeah. but having said that judicious sun exposure is really important yeah and this is where there is a little bit of tension i think in in the sort of world of medics because most dermatologists would suggest that you should stay out of the sun between 11 and 3 when it's at its highest Mm -hmm. and you should always have like, sort of really good sunscreen on. Whereas when you look at sort of populations of people, I think there was a study from Sweden that showed that actually the higher your chronic sun exposure, the lower your all-cause mortality and risk of cancers was. Hmm. And so you have to think, okay, well, why is that? And I think I it's probably related to uh, levels of naturally made vitamin D, maybe. That's my hypothesis. Mm-hmm. And you make most 
when the sun is at its strongest mm -hmm. so it's, it's really so about interesting <laughs> I, I think sometimes we want to look at one thing as oh if it causes this then it must be all bad for all the reasons right like oh you know the dermatologist like what you're saying in regards to people who don't wear sunscreen might have like as adults like you definitely get wrinkles yeah you definitely get wrinkles yeah. a lot more you know this way out of your vein then yeah. you know, maybe you want to be right. making sure you put more right. sun cream on. but what is the balance of having a healthy amount of sun exposure for yeah. the optimal amount of benefits while also reducing your risk of other things yeah i know it's That's tough so but it, also you don't make it through the window so you mm -hmm. have to be actually outside you have to be outside yeah okay so let's get into teeth health and kind yeah. of piggyback on the topic of k2 because that is something and, and also just about oral hygiene because that is a big a big topic i think with healthy children a lot of kids had ca have cavities on any diet when you look at how many children have cavities it's something like 54 percent at least in america wow um i looked at um, the nih i was looking at like tooth decay and the amount of kids that have like two or three dental caries or tooth rot tooth decay it's a really high amount for a lot of different reasons so let's talk about oral hygiene. Let's talk about okay. Um, <laughs> like well, not, what helps? I, I preface yes. this by saying I'm not a dentist. You're not a dentist, yes. <laughs> but but well, as logically, I'd logic say. and two mothers, yeah. and you are a doctor, so you're smart. <laughs> oh, thanks, Ellen. <laughs> let's, just, okay. let's just talk about that. So logically, I'd say it's important to make sure that you're limiting the free sugars in your child's diet if you want to make sure that they have general good dental health. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to be wanting to give them a load of um, like fizzy. Um, sugar sweetened beverages mm -hmm. Because that's clearly going to have an impact on their dental enamel. That actually includes kombucha too. Our holistic dentist is like kombucha was what I see in my holistic families. They do too much kombucha. Right, because it causes <laughs> yeah. difficulties with the enamel. Mm -hmm. Right, so fizzy drinks, sugar sweetened drinks. That's that's the main thing. I say if you're going to be focusing mm -hmm. on anything, that would be great. Um, ensuring that calcium is adequate, which we've already covered, and you know the 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 K two question. I think. We now understand that it is um, helpful to have K2 for healthy bones, um, just as it's important to have calcium, just as it's important to exercise and move mm -hmm. your body, just as it you know, is important for all of these things. If your child has a history of having a lot of antibiotics, um, or you know, as we mentioned before, things that would inhibit their gut health, then maybe you consider having um, a K2 supplement if you want to. It's not required by any guidelines, mm -hmm. um, but if you want to, you can. So calcium, yes. Fermented foods, yes. Sugar sweetened beverages, no. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to things like juices and smoothies, just be aware that they can you know, have a lot of sugar in. So you maybe want to rinse your child's mouth out if you, yeah. you know, if, if they've been prone to cavities to make sure that they're not, you know, got those free sugars hanging around for too long. Don't clean their teeth within half an hour of having those sugary foods though, because then that's when the enamel is weaker. Mm -hmm. So just. Maybe even with, that, that sugary foods include smoothies and even just a bowl of fresh fruit. Like yeah. we do the same thing, whether your kids, I think even aren't prone to dental ca like dental caries, you still, it's still a good habit to get into. I think to rinse your mouth with water after having like fresh fruit and smoothies Yeah. and then waiting, like you said, 30 minutes yeah, to brush wait, your teeth, wait to brush your teeth. So don't, don't eat straight, uh, straight before you brush, brush your teeth so that you can you know, protect your enamel. Um, and make sure your kids are brushing their teeth properly as well. Uh, dentists tend to advise fluoride based toothbrush, uh, toothpaste. You don't have to do that. Um, fluoride has been helpful for dental um, hygiene, but maybe less helpful for other things. So you don't have to use a fluoride based toothpaste, but if you do, again, I would suggest probably rinsing it out after you've used it and only using small amounts. I think parents can sometimes overestimate how much to use. But other parents with a more natural lifestyle may decide, actually, I don't want to clean my kids' teeth, or you know, maybe they'll use the um, those tongue um, scrapers. Yeah. I would suggest it's worth cleaning their teeth properly mm -hmm. and making sure that they're doing that, mm -hmm. just to make sure that you reduce their risk of cavities. Whatever I, whatever toothpaste you want to use. Totally, and I, I think I think this is a really important note to bring up in regards to like just brushing their teeth really well, because a lot of parents can tend to get a little bit passive about it, because you're like, oh, it's such a pain, or the kids don't want to do it, and they resist me on it. Especially if you're coming from like an attachment parenting, respectful parenting approach, it can be easy to be like, oh, they they really don't want to do it. I don't want to like force them to brush their teeth too much, but 
education is super important as they especially as they get older and can understand better um so like all of our kids are in the habit of rinsing their mouth with water after they have fresh fruit and you know waiting 30 minutes to brush their teeth and then the actual brushing teeth part we use an electric electric toothbrush yeah and that's um, great yeah electric toothbrush is incredible i know it's tempting to want to just use the bamboo one and be all zero waste but the electric toothbrush just cleans your teeth so much better <laughs> and going to the dentist on a regular basis for clean for checkups it's mm-hmm. this is again one of the things that i brought up earlier how sometimes i think natural parents can go a little too far with the wanting to be so natural where we just ban all western anything right but go, taking your kids to re- regular dental checkups so that if they do have a small cavity that you, you can either get it filled or um have ways to approach it instead of just like ignoring it to where it festers and causes more bacteria and more cavities which is yeah. what so many people find themselves in a place of because they neglected a tiny little cavity that could have just gotten filled and then just taking better dental hygiene yeah for um, sure if you have a cavity it has to be filled you yeah you want to be increasing risk of infection yeah <laughs> you want to increase like spreading it and having more and more mm. and then just like making sure to brush the full two minutes and you know you can do fun things like there's like a toothbrush app with like these little bouncy little cartoon characters that brush their teeth with you so that they get excited to brush their teeth mm. and I, I found that really helpful too so Great. that the kids get the all of them out and it kind of shows them where to go so they learn and reach all of their teeth um so i think that that's really helpful too good tips yeah (laughs) i'm really passionate about the the teeth health and um i think starting at a young age as well do you have thoughts on like how young of an age you should start like brushing their teeth really well is it basically just as soon as they start solid foods or what do you think yeah i think to make it playful from when they're starting to wean is great so that it's just part of their routine when they're having more food is is when you start to clean their teeth i don't think is you don't need to clean your baby's teeth but yeah (laughs) you don't have any yeah basically (laughs) when they start to grow teeth and they start to wean then that's a great time to to think about making it playful and and introducing that right my kids had like Kofax had like six teeth before he was six months old Mm -hmm. and when he started having solid foods probably around like seven or eight months old he was still breastfeeding we weren't weaning but since he was having solid foods that's kind of when we started brushing yeah brushing their teeth yeah yeah and also about the fluoride thing my holistic dentist talks a little bit about this other ingredient that's like a great alternative to fluoride which is like hydroxy I forget the exact word have you heard of it I think that's right yes I'll I'll put it right here on video overlay if you're watching this on video um but but she talks really highly of that and there's a good idea our toothpaste bite toothpaste that we use has is that has that ingredient in it yeah it's good okay oh and also flossing yeah this is another thing that i think parents can really put on the back burner mm-hmm. and just think oh just you know maybe once a month but no like we floss our kids teeth every day in the evenings before bed and i know it's a pain but just try your best to make it fun and not make it like so i don't know not fun yeah. <laughs> it's hard we'll, we'll, we'll sing songs and yeah. you know now now when we teach our older kids sandy and elvis like how to do it so now they basically know how to do it themselves but we still check yeah and doing that every night but I think I can't drive this home, point home enough because a lot of times I'm, I see people kind of jump to a conclusion like this must be what caused my kids to have a couple cavities or four cavities or tooth decay or tooth rot. But a lot of times there's so much more to the story on how, what what kind of like diet someone was eating, how good their oral hygiene was. Were you taking your kids to regular dentist checkups so that you could like dip something in the butt? Bud? I'm so bad at that phrase. Bud. Bud. <laughs> I always want to say butt. It's to do with flowers. Oh, okay. <laughs> I want to say nip it in the butt. I don't know why. <laughs> Even in the bud, but that way you can like take care of it from the beginning, get advice from your dentist because yeah. they do have good advice. So that's their job in regards to teeth health. We really like our holistic dentist that we go to, and our kids have great teeth. So, Fabulous. Yeah. Great. Yeah. No, that's okay. all good advice. Okay, great. So let's get into breastfeeding because mm. I know a lot of people have questions about breastfeeding because of course obviously breastfeeding is like the most nutritionally wonderful food for babies Um, but people have concerns and questions like what if I don't make enough breast milk and what should I do if I can't breastfeed Um, why don't you just go ahead and start and I have thoughts too and I'll just piggyback off yeah you you piggyback yeah (laughs) so I mean breast milk as everybody most people know is is great because it's made specifically for your baby and it has something called HMOs human milk oligosaccharides which are a type of specialized protein which is re- really helpful for helping to feed uh, and seed a really great microbiome from a very young age so and also we have these amazing receptors in our nipples uh, in our areola area that pick up on what antibodies the baby needs so it helps to reduce risk of diarrhea and infections and other issues so 
Yes, of course, breast milk is great, but not everybody can. So I think first up, it's really important to support new mothers in that journey. I myself found it really painful. And I knew as a doctor, yeah, breast is best. And that's what we tell everybody. But when you're doing it yourself, it's a whole other story. You know, it's mm-hmm. so painful, especially if you have, a child has a difficult latch or their tongue tie or or you just start off with the wrong technique and then you end up, if the baby's sucking on the nipple and not yeah. the areola, mm-hmm. uh, you start to get quite sore. Uh, you, know, you can get cracks and chaps and um, inflamed and infected areas, and mastitis. You know, There's a few issues. So if you know about the issues in advance, yeah. that's great because then you know what to expect. You know how to um, deal with these things early if they happen. And you, know, you ultimately want to be supported on your breastfeeding journey because if you are a vegan parent, it's really the very best choice. It's, mm-hmm. not, it's not just the best choice, but it is the optimal choice because you're not going to necessarily want to use the um, cow's milk-based formulas for your baby. So yeah, if you can breastfeed, that's ideal. Um, and hopefully you can get support along the way. I had support myself from a government-funded clinic that helped mums to you know do like a breastfeeding advice which was great um, I used nipple shields for a while I used a pump an electric pump for a while to sort of you know, take the pressure off um, you know, I had to do it whilst going back to work after a relatively short time just six months I was then having to pump at work so there's a lot of considerations mm-hmm. uh, a lot of practicalities that you don't really be aware of until you're doing it yourself so yeah I think encouraging mums to at least have an understanding about what it could involve and one of the things I hear a lot in my practice is that mums worry that if the baby starts to cluster feed or feeding a lot more in the night or seems more hungry that they're not producing enough milk actually chances are they are producing enough milk and it's a completely normal process for the baby to cluster feed when they want to try and like they're going through a growth spurt and they want to just kind of stimulate more milk production then you go ahead and make more milk absolutely um so that's so so don't start weaning because you think they're hungry because chances are actually that's just their way of getting more milk out of you i'm so yes i'm so passionate about that because i think so many times we're very quick to not um believe in ourselves and know that we can um and do produce the right amount of milk for our for our babies and so it's easy to want to think oh no I don't have enough milk when really if we could understand the biological process of what's happening is your baby is signaling to your body to produce more milk as it goes through a growth spurt and that is a beautiful good thing so you just have to keep going and it takes a week or two weeks and then before you know it they're settled back down and it's not such a fussy feed because your body you taught your it your baby taught through his or her suckling to make more milk so it's it's a good thing and you know like it or not most of our milk production is in the early hours of the morning <laughs> so, yeah so keeping your baby near you you mm-hmm. don't want to be having to get up and turn the light on and mm-hmm. wake up you just want to try and do it as easy and quick as possible yeah so that you feel more rested I think that's important mm-hmm. I think a lot of new mums worry okay I've got to get the right position and I've got to turn the lights up and figure out what I'm doing mm-hmm. and you know that can then also cause you to have problems with your sleep because right. it's hard sometimes yeah. to sleep with a newborn you know it's going to be a tough few totally. weeks and years you want to make it as easy as possible on yourself mm-hmm. so ideally perhaps keep them very close by maybe even right next to your bed or mm-hmm. some parents like to co-sleep as well yeah. um, although I would say if that's something that you're interested in doing make sure that you don't drink alcohol yes or be on medication or any medications that can interfere with your ability to wake up in the night and obviously not smoking as well yes absolutely yeah for sure. Oh, that's so good. I'm I'm super passionate about breastfeeding, um, and I really one of my biggest goals while being on social media. Like, if I can look back at my time on social media when I'm an old woman, and I think what were some of my biggest, most important priorities in hopefully inspiring or just I don't know helping is like trying to empower women to. Um, be able to breastfeed because there's so much confusion like I know the first time that I breastfed I was so confused I was scared I was crying a lot my nipples hurt I also did the nipple shield for a while I would call my midwife just in tears because I'm like just didn't understand how to do it I couldn't get him to latch it's just so confusing and we tend to think that it just must be like a very instinctive process where we much we must just naturally know how to do it the moment that we become a mother but really your baby is learning how to breastfeed just like you are learning how to breastfeed and we really need the guidance and support and love from like a um like a well-seasoned 
breastfeeder who knows yeah. how to breastfeed, either a lactation consultant or a mother of some sort who knows how to breastfeed and can guide you throughout that. Because it's really not just like a 30 minute call or one little consultation. It takes a lot of practice. And yeah. So I'm really passionate about like anyone, if you do breast, if you've known how to breastfeed to support any young new mother that you know that is struggling and go to their home if they want your help, you know, obviously don't barge in, but if they want your help, (laughs) you know, I'm like, I'm here if you need any help. Like I just, I just love that. I think once I figured it out and once we really had a good breastfeeding relationship, it was so easy and it was the most beautiful thing ever. It was just really, really hard in the beginning. Yeah. And then after all the other ones, I knew what I was doing. So it was a breeze. It was just so easy because I knew exactly what I was doing and there's so many different questions and concerns and so I have a breastfeeding ebook online that I made really affordable it's only ten dollars and anyone who is listening to this if they can't afford it just email me even if they can't afford even the ten dollars just email me and I will send it to you because it's just something I'm really passionate about and I worked with a lactation consultant um, who's here on island named Natalie Marcus and she helped me write it and yeah, there's just so many, so many things that I think can be really helpful that I wish I knew when yeah. I had first had my first. Exactly. And it's interesting because my journey as a doctor and my journey as a mother have been very interesting because you know, what you learn as a doctor is actually not the same as what you learn as a mother. Mm-hmm. And for me, my understanding of the breastfeeding journey has been infused with a lot more compassion because I found it so hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I want every like to be mum out there to know that sometimes it's hard and that's okay and as long as you get the support you can hopefully make it through but even if you don't and your mental health is suffering please you know just remember that a fed baby is is best best, yeah and to not have shame yeah please yeah don't don't feel that way because you know many many mums get so upset when Mm -hmm. they feel like they failed Mm -hmm. and so having the right support in place early is important because it's not always natural Mm -hmm. and it is hard Mm -hmm. and it can be painful but then hopefully if you're getting through that and you're feeling good then it's very empowering however if you haven't and there's other reasons why you haven't been able to breastfeed that's okay yeah there's actually some really extreme circumstances and situations as well like if you needed surgery and have to be on medication and can't breastfeed or i i one of the women that i donated breast milk to had like really really bad mastitis in one breast and had to have surgery i forget what the exact reason was but on one of her breasts so she could only nurse from one breast for like three months straight so having that donated milk for me like helped supplement that for her Mm -hmm. so i love what you're saying about no shame and like supporting all women through whatever their journeys are because everyone's just doing their best yeah and at the end of the day i think like my passion stems from just help hopefully helping to like encourage that in a way that empowers women to be able to do it and for those who can't and aren't able to um i'm really passionate about donating breast milk that's another part of this puzzle piece of like if i look back in my life um and what i would be hoping to have inspired other mothers to do is that if you can breastfeed if you are a comfortable situation and you make plenty and lots of milk consider donating your breast milk um to women who need it i've always always been able to find someone who needed um, the breast milk, it was never a problem. So with every kid after the first one, at the first one, I didn't do this, but with the second, third and fourth kid, after about four weeks postpartum, I start to pump every morning, first thing in the morning, because it's the best. I mean, I have all this in my breastfeeding ebook tips, ebook on like the best times to pump, but, um, to be able to maximize the amount of milk that you get out. But basically you teach your body to make more milk, just like with the cluster feeding mm. through pumping, you can also do that. And so I teach my body at an early postpartum phase to make more milk so that I can pump eight ounces every single morning, put it in the freezer and donate it. With every kid, I've been able to donate over 2,000 ounces of breast milk. And it's amazing, so it? rewarding. And if more of us could do that, yeah. how supported we could help other mothers who aren't able to breastfeed. It's so true. Yeah. I remember pumping with my two. Uh, I ended up I ended up breastfeeding for, I think, a year and a half with both. Um, but I stored my own breast milk because I didn't really, I wasn't really aware of a breast donation scheme where I am um, mm-hmm. so it would be great to know more and hopefully yeah. be able to encourage women to do that but I uh, also um, stored my own breast milk in the freezer and I stockpiled it because it can last in the back of your freezer for a year yeah so for me that was so important because I had to go back to work after mm-hmm. six months and I was able to continue giving my children my breast milk when I wasn't there 
because I could yes. then just you know it was there it was yes. in the free- freezer it was it was yes. available and uh, you know that was really helpful for me I also did that with my first kid I was a waitress at the time so we have a much shorter um, postpartum ability with government assistance and so I went back to work at three months postpartum and also so also early. did so I know early. it's really a shame we should really be looking at these other countries that have longer postpartum days and even have f- paternal um, postpartum some yeah. states do that now actually though where they have paternal pay for postpartum mm. not postpartum but sorry like uh, what's the word like after you have a Pret- baby yes like maternity yeah. pay but maternity but fraternity for, for, leave for, yeah. <laughs> yes that um anyway so I did the same as well and I would pump in the back of because it was such a priority to me so like there would they by law at least in California at the time you were half you had the every workplace was supposed to have like a, pl- a breastfeeding room but at a restaurant they did not have this so I ended up having to pump like in the manager's office and like we, they would like close all the cameras and grab all the keys from the different chefs and everything and it was totally embarrassing but it was worth it it should be easier for women it really yeah. needs to be easier yeah. I was doing it at work in my office so I had to shut yeah. the door lock it <laughs> <laughs> and they're pumping between right. my my patients. Right, you know, it's it's hard. It is. It's um, a lot of work. It is. It is a lot of work. Yeah, but it's worth it. I've got a funny story. My sister was helping me uh, in the early days. I was crying. I was in pain. I had you know chapped nipples, and I asked her to go down to the pharmacy for me to get me a nipple shield. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so she went down there. She's a lot younger than me, and mm-hmm. she's never you know she she didn't she wasn't familiar with these things. And she just remembered it wrong. So she went up to the <laughs> pharmacist and said, oh, um, I'd like to buy some nipple clamps, please. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've been the so pharmacist much. looked at her like, uh, I think you're in the wrong shop. I think you need to go um, to the erotic shop. Yeah, that's, that's not here. And she was like, oh, um, uh, I don't mean that. What were they called? Um, <laughs> that is hilarious. I know. That is so funny. I, I also know. used a nipple shield because I couldn't, with the first baby because I couldn't get the latch proper mm. properly. And then I, once I got my baby on the nipple shield for a consistent amount of time I really wanted to wean him off of the nipple shield I was so annoyed of it having yeah. to like put it on and wash it all the time so I actually went to like a baby new mother support group who like I got amazing advice from these different women on how to wean him off of it yeah. and within like I think three weeks I got him off of it after he was like it was like three months old and then yeah. three weeks after that once I learned some tips so yeah. that was really helpful as well to go through like breastfeeding support groups it is but for people who don't have that kind of support who don't have the option to get donated breast milk which for I just want to say if you're interested in that human milk for human babies um, in America at least they have Facebook groups all around the country in different big cities to where you can go and ask for a donated breast milk and say you're looking for it and different mothers can connect with you so check that out human milk for human um, and their Facebook groups. But for those who don't have that option, what is your best advice for formula? So it depends on the age of your baby. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for most most parents who are raising their children vegan, they're gonna wanna breastfeed until the age of one, ideally, and then they could go straight to a fortified plant milk mm-hmm. rather than a dairy milk. That's the easiest option. Mm-hmm. If that's not possible, um, then the type of milk would actually really depend on what age the baby is. Because if your baby is newborn, uh, then the guidelines for the vegan nutrition guideline is to avoid uh, soy milk based formulas based on their body size and the amount of soy yeah. that you have in the formula. Mm-hmm. Um, now, interestingly, I spoke to a pediatrician about this, and she has been, uh, she's called Dr. Uh, Miriam. Uh, Martinez Biage and she works at Imperial I believe in London and she was telling me that she's worked with countless families who either because of cow milk uh, protein allergy or because they want to raise their children vegan did not want to go for um, a cow's milk based formula she said that they tend uh, babies tend to tolerate soy based formulas really well they tend to like the taste of them and they have been safe and effective used for over a hundred years and in fact a recent meta-analysis has compared um, the soy milk uh, formula ba- fed babies with cow's milk formula ba- fed babies and uh, it, they basically concluded that there was no significant difference between the two in terms of their development which I think is really important to yeah. highlight that being said she does give a few caveats so if your baby is premature and spent time on NICU it's best to avoid soy milk based formulas yeah. Um, if they were born with congenital hypothyroidism, it's best to avoid soy based, soy milk based formulas. Um, and it's generally much less of a concern really once they're six months plus and you're beginning the weaning process. Uh, it's 
very common and normal to be giving your child a soy milk based formula at that stage when they're six months plus um, as well as the weaning so you can do them together and yeah it seems to be a perfectly valid option uh, so yeah there's also hydrolyzed rice based formulas which are made in parts of Europe they may be made in the US as well they are also deemed to be safe and appropriate for babies they don't contain arsenic because there is a concern with mm -hmm. rice milks in general for older children it's best to generally avoid those under the age of five because of a risk potential risk of arsenic exposure that's not the case when it comes to hydrolyzed rice based formulas for babies there's mm -hmm. no risk there so yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. I think most people would just go for cow's milk based formulas, but what I would say is whatever you choose to do, most important thing under the age of one is to never make your own milk for okay. your baby. Okay, let's talk about that. So that's kind of a trend I'm seeing a little bit on like how to make your own even raw milk formula or just like making your own formula. Can you explain why you think that's so important to not make that? Well, the Food Standards Agency tells us not to do it because there are potential infection risks um, which you know is, is very important to realize yeah. and also big nutritional gaps mm -hmm. so th the main two reasons are nutritional gaps for the baby and infection risks for the baby mm -hmm. please please use yes. formula or breast milk mm -hmm. under the age of one yeah and actually a lot of these like vegan parent horrible stories that you were talking about earlier yeah. was from babies who were under a year old that were or even under six months old that were just literally not fed breast milk or formula but yeah exactly like, come on how are you calling that a vegan parent thing that's just like a not well-informed parent <laughs> yeah it's true yeah um, so i would say 100 percent formula or breast milk mm -hmm. under the age of one over yeah. the age of one you can give them any milk you want, um, as, except the rice milk, as I mentioned. Um, mm. But I would generally advise people to go for, for for fortified soy milk, because if you are somebody that doesn't plan as much as someone like yourself might, then it just gives you those extra reassurances that you're giving yeah. them the extra bits and pieces, like the calcium, vitamin D, iodine. But also, um, soy milk is nutritionally very similar to cow's milk in terms of the protein content, and soybeans are, you know, a complete source of proteins, a complete source of uh, all essential amino acids as well. Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah, so all that is really interesting. I've never actually spoken on any of that because I am, like I said, my main goal is to, like, hopefully inspire more women to breastfeed or uh, hopefully more inspire more women to be able to breastfeed and also to other women who have plenty of milk to donate so that we can help other women to at least even supplement with some donated breast milk if they're doing formulas so they at least get some of it. Yeah. Um, that would be fantastic. We need a lot more of it though, and it's yeah. obviously not, it's idealistic, and so that's just not in the place that we're at. Um, but anything to help more women to be able to breastfeed would be amazing, while at the same time being like not shameful and loving and supportive of everyone in their own stories. Mm -hmm. um, my own personal like story with breastfeeding, I breastfeed all my kids to around two. That's what the World Health Organization um, yeah. says is optimal, actually. Yeah, yeah. So the World Health Organization says that breastfeeding to two is optimal mm -hmm. and that you could decide to do it for longer if you wanted to. Yeah. It's not a problem. Yeah, actually, one of my kids, I did breastfeed for even longer than that and did, like, tandem nursing for a while. But I'm like, oh, that was a lot. Tandem nursing, that was a lot. <laughs> but two years old is um, is kind of how all of my kids have been. And then we don't do any fortified milks, like I said earlier. So do you feel like for people who are planning their well planning their diet eating a wide variety and also breastfeeding like ex extended to like what the world health organization recommends do you feel like a plant milk is necessary i feel like you've already said not if you're well planning but just to like kind of bring that home with the different ways of raising kids plant-based no i mean it's very personal to each family so mm -hmm. it's not necessary yeah no it's just uh, another good option yeah, yeah. Um, and interestingly i should also say that breastfeeding is helpful for mom it reduces risk of breast cancer and mm -hmm. It's a form of contraception mm -hmm. because yeah. you're not going to be ovulating, especially, I would say, as a caveat, in the first six months of breastfeeding. Yeah. After the child starts weaning, yeah. you're not careful. Gonna, you need to be much more careful. <laughs> um, but during that first six months, if you are exclusively breastfeeding and the child has no other supplemental milk, your baby um, just is having your milk, then there's a 98% effectiveness in terms of contraceptive you know, from breastfeeding. Perfect. As well. Um, people don't always realize There's a, there's a lot of benefits. <laughs> yeah, people don't always know that. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question that's kind of like, well, kind of bringing things back to the, our other topic of uh, supplements and nutrients. Do you think kids or parents should be getting their children's blood levels checked regularly or sometimes or never, not necessary? What are your thoughts on that? I don't think it's generally necessary. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it's not something that we have guidelines on in the UK. It's not something that, that's generally advocated for. Uh, if you are able to feel confident in providing your child with a variety of nutrient-rich foods and you're supplementing regularly on a plant-based diet with vitamin B12 and on any diet with, with vitamin D and following guidelines perhaps very similar in the US to the UK, uh, just a multivit with vitamins A and K as well, giving them a nice, broad, uh, rich diet full of diverse plant foods. You yeah. don't need to get their blood levels checked. Yeah. As I mentioned, the German study, the Vichy study, that the vegan children had uh, an abundance of a variety of different nutrients that the uh, omnivorous children uh, had less of. I didn't, mm -hmm. I'm not saying they didn't have them, but yeah. you know, there's so much emphasis on making sure that it's safe. Actually, it's, it's, you know, it's abundant. Um, and then, as I say, there's just a few key nutrients to be more aware of, which I think we've covered really well. Yes. Oh, we yeah. covered it so good. I only have like one more question because I feel like we've talked about so much amazing things. But what do you think after breastfeeding, those first foods should be on a healthy diet? So, yeah, um, you want to, it depends if you want to, uh, what age you're weaning. So uh, generally it's from six months. Some parents choose to wean a bit earlier than that if their children, if they deem their baby to be ready. So if the baby is sitting upright, independently, able to, to control their head, able to uh, grasp at, f at foods, able to want to put them in their mouth, mm -hmm. um, have the coordination to grab and mm -hmm. put things in their mouth, uh, then they can be a bit younger than six mm -hmm. months, right? Um, but if they are six months, uh, or four or five, six months, then you generally would be going for more pureed options rather than baby led weaning of grabbing actual mm -hmm. solid foods like, uh, you know, like steamed carrot sticks or broccoli and stuff like that. They're, they're a little bit young. So sort of four to six, seven months, you'd be thinking, okay, well, let me steam some vegetables. Um, so things like you know, sweet potatoes and carrots and um, normal potatoes and uh, mashed up, things like mashed up beans with breast milk or formula, if that's what you're using. Um, so that they've got these new tastes that they can start to experiment with, but their milk should still be their main source of nutrition. So you're not really aiming at that young age to yeah. give them their nutrition through food. Mm -hmm. It's more experimentation. And then as they get sort of seven, eight, nine months, you're going to be more confident in giving them actual sort of more solid type foods, giving them the opportunity to feel what different textures and uh, feel in the mouth as well, which will help their their jaw and uh, help their gums and help their teeth coming through. So that's another nice mm. thing to introduce, like nut butters as well, um, like things like little rice cakes, um, uh, veggie, veggie sticks, you know, stuff like that is yeah. really nice to be able to offer the uh, offer your child um, chopped up, like, you know, dates or you know, whatever else you want to give them that's mm -hmm. small. I would be just cautious to say things like tomatoes and grapes, you should always cut in half. You don't want to risk your child choking. Gagging is actually quite normal when you're learning how to eat. Mm -hmm. So please don't be alarmed if you see your child kind of pushing a food forward with their tongue on mm -hmm. occasion or their eyes watering and they're kind of going, <coughs> yeah. um, that's that freak kind out. of, that <laughs> gagging, try not to freak out yeah. because that's actually a normal part of them figuring out mm -hmm. the way of moving their jaw mm -hmm. to chew mm -hmm. and you know, swallow, which yeah. are all skills that the yeah. baby has to learn. Yeah. If they're if they're choking, that's different. So maybe a basic first aid course. If you you know if you're not sure what to do, like give them the back slaps or hold them yeah. upside down. But gagging, you don't need to worry too much. Mm -hmm. That's actually quite common and normal. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's kind of what you'd start with, and then. I think probably from about the age of nine months onwards, you'd basically be giving them chopped up versions of what you would normally eat as a family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, You don't really having having to make separate meals for your baby. You and actually that can kind of encourage more picky eating habits. If you, if you start at such a young age to be like, oh, I don't want them eating what I'm, I'm having because mine might have too much garlic in it or too much of this. But if you just start like feeding them what you're feeding your kids, yeah. you know, that develops really healthy habits with your kids in your home. Yeah, exactly. Just, just be aware, salt. Yeah. Cause like some some parents really have a a, a a desire to have more salty food. Yeah, you don't want to have too much salt in the in the children, yeah. children's meals. So maybe add salt later if you want to have salt on your, <laughs> on your or meal. being the example is such a huge thing. Like if you know maybe we shouldn't be having like too much salt. Like just as a family, adopt that so that your kids are all just eating in the same way. Yeah, and hopefully they'll start to reap those benefits. And yeah. I mentioned earlier briefly in the podcast about how allergies are increasing, mm -hmm. asthma, eczema, 
and food intolerances having a healthy plant-based diet is a great way of reducing that risk so yeah it's yes, it's all good that's great i also want to say that like for us our children's first foods are always avocado or banana papayas because mm. that's like what's local to us coconut delicious fresh coconut flesh that's soft not like yeah. the super hard coconut um and then just and we generally actually wait till they're like seven or eight months just for the ease and also until they have like a lot of teeth where it's just easy because yeah. we do more baby lead weaning yeah and then as they get older none of and it is mostly breast milk even through the whole year of life so even at one year our babies don't really start eating a significant portion of their calories from like foods until like 12 or 14 months. Mm-hmm. It just has happened very naturally like that for us just because they are more interested in breast milk and then food is more play in the first year of life Yeah, and just introducing new foods. So what about for people, and since we're talking about introducing foods, who, who wonder, should I give my child my plant-based child animal food so that to see if they're allergic or I, I get questions like that sometimes what are your thoughts on that so it depends if you have a strong family history of allergy yourself for say for example you have a strong um, nut allergy um, then the national institute for allergy and infectious diseases states that it's actually really important to see whether your child may or may not have an allergic reaction to that and the same could be said as well for things like eggs so The choice is obviously up to the individual family, but if you have a strong allergic reaction to eggs, then the guidance is that you should give egg to your child early on to see what happens. So the main two reasons being you want to make sure that you know if they're at risk of dying, if they are exposed to egg inadvertently Mm -hmm. when they're older. Right. But also maybe they might choose to eat egg when they're not in your presence sometime Mm -hmm. and you don't know. You want to know how serious You want to know if that's something that's actually going to cause a problem for them. So there was a really interesting study based out of the UK. It's called LIPAS. um, And it was a trial of high-risk babies. And it was with regard to nut allergies, actually. And what they did is they looked at what the parents chose to do with exposing their baby to nuts. So it's perfectly normal and natural to give your baby a nut butter in the first year of life and when the parents gave their high-risk babies a a nut butter between the ages of um, four and ten months out of those sample high-risk babies 1.9 percent of them developed a nut allergy Hmm. with the the families where they decided to avoid nuts completely and then they exposed the child to um, a nut um, after the age of three then 14 percent of those babies or children developed a nut allergy interesting so it seems like actually previous advice is wrong the earlier the exposure the less likely they Mm -hmm. would be to develop an allergy right so i don't think it's particularly important or relevant if you don't have a family history of allergies Mm -hmm. so if you want to raise your child vegan and you don't have a family history of allergies there's no reason to give your child eggs Mm -hmm. for example yeah but if you do then there may be some benefits to it Right, like especially if it's like strong allergies for things like anaphylactic type of allergies. Exactly. You want to be prepared. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And do you think, though, maybe the allergy thing could be associated with different factors that are modern to today's world? Uh, Maybe. And uh, and there's different kinds of allergy. So, you know, we know, I know we talked earlier about adaptations for dairy, for example. Mm -hmm still around 70% of the global population is lactose intolerant. That's not strictly an allergy, but it's an intolerance. Yeah. And so I think when there's such a strong societal focus on giving your child cow's milk, you're actually potentially doing them a disservice, mm-hmm. especially if you're in the global majority yeah. that has a lactose intolerance. Yeah, which then again just goes back to our physiology and what we're exactly. really supposed to be eating. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. wow, we talked about so much. Uh, this is amazing. Thank you for everything that you shared. I, I feel like we covered a lot. We did. <laughs> like a lot. We did, and we didn't even deep dive into like, <laughs> so, so many of the things. Yeah, but that was good. I, I loved that. It was I a love it. Yeah, and we could totally do a deep dive part two another time (laughs) maybe you'll come back to hawaii i'd love to come back maybe i'll go to britain one day yeah sure (laughs) great well thank you so much i am so appreciative of all that you shared this was just amazing and i think so helpful so great thank you ellen it's been an absolute pleasure great okay bye